Hello, this is the weekly jail call, and we have Antronik, Jan, and myself, Michael. I think others will trickle in, and we'd like to start with a few uh, security issues that have arisen. Uh, Jan, you were describing this first of them. So um, the bug report I mentioned is in the FreeBSD bug tracker under the link here. Uh, no, I don't think. Wait, uh, yes, this is the one. <clears throat> the problem is that it assumes there are two jails connected over a Unix domain socket, and they're exchanging file descriptors as ancillary data. In one of the type of file descriptors you can send is a file descriptor to an open directory, as mentioned in step three. And what you would expect is that it's a capability, you can use it as a capability, and that by sending the capability doesn't get more powerful. So you shouldn't gain any privileges for, on the file descriptor just by sending it to another jail. Right now, it looks like this is what happens. So that the receiver of the file descriptor is no longer restricted to the jail's root directory using this file descriptor and can then cd dot dot out of the jail. The we receiver, okay. Of course, if you, uh, I don't know what happens if you send it back to the original jail or what happens is one of the, is a child jail of the other. So basically, if the jail can start a child jail and do this trick with just the jail and its child jail. But uh, there is a fix in the works. Um, the, you are unlikely to encounter this by accident, but it is a privilege escalation attack. Understood. Do you know if any uh, jail management tools would support this interconnect intercommunication mm. via file descriptors? You don't even fun. have to because... Okay. Um, how it was discovered is by having a null FS mounted into both jails and then the one side running a bound Unix socket server and the null FS which the other one connects to. But there are other ways of, of obtaining file descriptors rather than just connecting to sockets. You could already have inherited a connected socket. And I see no reason why this exploit shouldn't work. Uh, if you someone on the host sets up a connected socket pair using the socket pair system call, so no file system interaction at all, and then spawns two jails connected that way. This would be useful for... Um, Privilege separation similar to what OpenBSD demons introduced. So where a single demon is split up into multiple compartments for security purposes. So you have the past network traffic compartment, you have uh, uh, interact with a file system compartment, and each one could be a jail. I don't know any software which does this, but it should be usable in this way. And there you would be able to break out even if you have the first fix. So the quick fix is just to add a mount flag to NullFS to disable the feature they used to discover the problem. But the problem isn't only accessible using NullFS. What would that flag be? Uh, the no sock bind flag. You can see that uh, in the bug report, oh, there, there are go. two yeah. um, reviews mentioned. The first is for the uh, no sock bind option, and the second one is the proper fix to uh, solve the underlying problem rather than make it harder to access. Okay. But it yeah. looks like people are on it and yes, also it's... on it in time for, oh, 2022. In time yeah, for it wasn't really um, handled as a big problem. 
Interesting. Well, that's why we're talking. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I guess I can grab the reviews from there. That is good to know. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Anything more on that one, or shall we segue into the next? Next, it just one. needs some eyes looking over the, especially the uh, proper fix. So far, only the usual suspects have subscribed. Okay. Is Jamie subscribed? No. Graham? Uh, could you add him? Oh, um, MG. Wait, who is MG? Hmm. Uh, okay. And who is? Her? I don't think I have a permission to subscribe someone else. Uh, step one, log in, see if that helps. Hmm? If you don't look like you're logged in, perhaps, so... No, no, I'm locked oh, you in. Are? Oh, you Oh, okay. You can't see my screen. I'm looking at Antronic's screen. Thank you very much. Okay, good, cool. <laughs> um, well, let's make a point of reaching out to Jamie after this. <clears throat> this one is actually interesting. There's also a quote-unquote exploit, which is, you know, you create a... There's a proof of concept for this. Yeah. It's in the bug report. So, yeah, yep. the, the exploit exists. Yeah, which is actually a very, very interesting one. I mean, it 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 sounds very uh, sane. I, I'm not sure if this is a bug or a, a feature kind of situation, you know, but I mean, obviously... It's definitely a bug. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, you shouldn't be able to mount from the outside, right? No, That's... no, it's not about the mounting. It's that the receiver, of, basically, when you open a directory and in a jail... Mm-hmm. Somewhere the kernel knows that this file descriptor is in this jail, mm -hmm. and this jail is restricted to this change root directory, so that you can't cd dot dot out of it yes. or open at dot 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 out of it. Yes. And this information is not preserved by the file descriptor passing over a socket. Oh. So you get a file descriptor without the jail specific restriction oh, but you were talking the about end. the this one right the unix domain yes uh, i i i i meant to the second one that th this one which is nullfs with enforce yep. statfs smaller than 2 You've moved the on. mount okay. is true and yep. mount null fs is true. I don't know you said we we're segueing to the next one. That's why I moved to the next yeah, one. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, so we, we have McDeer J this is jail one temp. Okay. You we run a jail in J1, makes sense. And then what is that inside of that? So in temp A, temp A B C, temp A B C test, temp A D, uh, null fs mount A B C to A D, A B C to A D. Okay. Move, what is that? Move, move A, B, C. Oh, move it up a directory, it looks okay. like. Okay, yeah, yes. Have a nice day. <laughs> and then have a nice day, yeah. Oh, you will see the fathers of the judge. Yeah, okay, okay. Ooh. Yeah, and this is where I couldn't uh, help myself get a bit annoyed with his response. Yeah, this, this response obviously doesn't make Basically, much of a Basically, someone sense. reported a bug and... Uh, with. Uh, Nobody replies, and then someone responds with, well, we've ignored your bug so long that the release you reported it on, which was supported at the time, is now end of life. Please reproduce. Well, uh, fortunately, it's a real simple reproduction, but yeah, that's a bit annoying. Yeah. Um, did you take that few minutes to reproduce it? I'm looking at your comment right now. Not yet. Okay. I didn't have a proper environment to test it in. Okay, that looks like it's at least easy to reproduce. And uh, kudos to the reporter for including uh, the reproduction information. And yes. If you aren't familiar with kudos, that's a silly saying in English. I'm sorry. <laughs> and the earlier one does have a proof of concept exploit as well. Okay. So I just dropped in the link to it. Uh, I I know I I I didn't know it was in English because I've heard it in other languages as well. Okay. Um, yeah. 
um, English went around all of Europe and large parts of the rest of the world with a club, just hit other languages, words over the head and took them home. It is derived from Greek. Kudos entered English as a popular slang at British universities. Mm. All right. So I actually, I feel like I'm from Cambridge by saying that. I thought I was from the gutter. <clears throat> this is the patch or is this the... This is the exploit. This is the exploit. Okay. For the socket connection. Yes. Or the, the first one. Proof of concept. It's not really weaponized. Yeah. yeah. First one or second mm. one? The first one, I guess. Because uh, it's using the Unix sockets. Okay. Yeah, there you go. The POC source. Okay, this is good. Thank you very much, Jan. Well, okay, but we have the new one in the family, right? Which was Broadstat exposing information. Yeah, that's the one I considered so far not good, but also not dangerous really yeah i can't see the harm in having this it's confusing no... it's not supposed to happen like that yes so i i also had a question because I, I i read it but i couldn't understand does this one rely on null fs or it doesn't matter it looks like it mm. post that vm I'm selecting kernel component because i expect this is a Sure, the current and the process beam command are wrong though. I'm like to this without me for this, but uh, okay. Is it worth noting that only root in the GR can execute? Tested on 13.2. Uh, things that did not help disallowing KMM and DevIO, prods FS in the jail, unprivileged prods debug on the host. Okay, got it, got it. Uh, canonically, proc, P R O C with a hard K instead of a C. Not a Latvian Eastern Sea. Just saying. Proc. And welcome to your colleague. Rock. Hi, Vahe. Can you hear us? And he left. He just left again. Maybe he's having... Oh, I think he's on Linux desktop, so he might be having some issues. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Pick your so, poison. Uh, mm. Okay. So so okay, and uh, what what do we? Uh, you asked the question right here, Jan, about uh, the. I also got an answer. Okay, which was one comment down. Zero, zero and one, okay, and two can't be reproduced because in that case you can't mount, which makes sense. Okay, got it, got it. Uh, oh, are you saying that protstat procstat? Executes from outside the jail. I think when null of null null mount are involved, even in the... interesting, interesting. So mount. Oh, okay. So as long as null fs is involved, it doesn't matter where you are executing from, nor nor yeah, but... if nor if what are these things nor if the libraries are in there yeah because this is part of the base system okay so this is a thin jail right that's what i understood mm. from this output it's not yeah depends on how you look at it but yes uh it's a thin jail using another face yeah and the problem is that you can see that you're a thin jail Mm -hmm. And even at a certain setting, the jail is supposed that setting one, you're supposed to uh, not be able to see that that easily. Yeah. And the jail prefix should get stripped from the paths. And it doesn't because it has been translated by another vest and isn't translated back, basically. Okay, I'll got it. Again. Yeah, got it. <clears throat> got it. Okay. But it's mostly, I would see it as a bug, as an annoyance, but not as a leak of something dangerous because the path shouldn't be a real secret. You shouldn't use your API key for some API as jail path prefix or yeah. something. Yeah. That would be a asking for pain. Yeah. But it's still a problem because it can break tooling if you expect paths to basically look the same in this command uh, in proc start as you throw them in. So it will break 
automations so, for debugging purposes. So, so and and, confuse users. So and, Andrew's analysis here is good, which is the VM full path is being called yep. to the physical file system, but then in the end, the VM object is apparently referencing the lower V node rather than the upper V node. The lower is the full path, and the upper is the one that should be displayed. Okay, okay, now I got the. I'm curious. Just thought of it. I'm curious to see what would happen if you mount the null FF with the undocumented no cache option. Okay, why is that not undocumented? I don't know why it's undocumented. I know what that it exists. But is it new? Because uh, null FS has been around since what for BSD four? No, no, uh, no. So has no cache has been around for ages. Basically, okay. for performance reasons, uh, the. NullFS, while it basically only remaps V nodes to mm -hmm. other V nodes, mm -hmm. uh, it does create its own V nodes which get cached. Okay, got as it. V nodes do. Uh, instead of always doing a cache lookup for the I node, mm -hmm. instead of doing the indirection every time, basically it caches the uh, I node number the, inside the V thing. node okay. to to uh, original file system underlay vnode yeah. to inode translation in Got its it. vnode so Got that it. you can go to uh, and avoid one level of interaction. The downside is that this caching keeps the reference counter up and has caused problems, at least in the past, that as long as the nullfs uh, vnode is cached, the underlying object doesn't ever reach... Uh, um, zero reference count. And so basically you're holding on to deleted files, le leaking effectively uh, disk capacity and stuff like mm. this. And I note numbers and mm. until you unmount or reboot. But 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 but, but uh, what what I <clears throat> want to understand is uh, so so okay, so one of the uh, things that Elizabeth Myers, which uh, welcome mm -hmm. her to the community. I've never seen her before in the community. Um, is that, let's see, uh, um, there was a very good point which that this cannot be weaponized, right? That was one of the concepts in here that someone wrote, which I, I'm not sure I can, maybe it was in the chat, right? Because you're only reading the path of the jail that you're not supposed to. But my question is, could the root cause of this be weaponized in some way? Not really. Not really. Right? I don't this see is, how. Because this is just a writing, uh, and and this is this is just a read access and the misconfiguration. Quote it's unquote. an information leak. Uh, the, yeah, the, it's, yeah, it's an information leak. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I don't think the it should be fixed. Issue could be yeah problematic. Okay. Do we have any patches or anything? No, we don't. Okay. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Sounds good to me. This was very interesting to read. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Michael's doing stuff here. Uh, Vahe, welcome to the free BSD GLS calls. How's your English? Why can you hear us? No, You're muted. muted. You are muted, by the way. Okay, maybe he's having audio issues. Uh, well, we'll wait. Uh, so, uh, yeah, welcome, Vahe. Uh, and thank you, Elizabeth, indeed. Um, anything else on this? Do you think these three issues are the scope of it, or are there more, been, more, more that are haven't been noticed? <laughs> well. Just search for jail in the back. I know. Well, I, that's possibly for later, but thought by last active and yep. um, pick I, a point and work for, uh, forward in time. Okay, I, I, that I, said, go ahead. I feel that we also need some kind of like tags in in uh, Bugzilla where we can tag things like you know security issue. Uh, cross compilation issue, blah 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 issue. Do we have that? Is is do, is that there even... are uh, tags you can assign? I see. I've never yep. seen them, but okay. Yeah, but so not these, here. These are, uh, so there are keywords and personal tags. I see. Ah, hey, how's your English or German or Latvian? 
Nasılsın ki canlıların ne yapacağım olsun. Okay, well you can you can it's okay you can try. Ki canlıların ne yapacağım diye ama canlıların çok karamsın. Okay, well apparently his English is not that well. Okay, well my German is terribly young as native. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, you can you can chat if you want to. But if I had a question about your yes. question was about uh, ZFS and recursive mounting in jails. Recursive? Uh, yes. Right. I so, want to, to recursively mount data set in the inside of a jail. Inside of a jail. So, 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 Vah Vah has a, uh, a, a an interesting jail uh, issue. Which let me just put it in here in the in the agenda. Maybe we'll get to it somewhere in here. Which is he has a data set that looks kind of like this. Let's say. Uh, go ahead. I've got him started uh, right there. Go up Z a little pool. bit. Antrenig, oh, scroll sure. up just a tiny bit. Sure, sure. There you go. Uh, which is he has let's say something that looks like Z pool and then. Z pool user data, and then let's say Z pool uh, user data, let's say uh, D zero and Z pool user data D one, right? And because he's using uh, free NAS, the uh, Z pool is mounted onto MNT, right, Michael? That's the default. As By default, as yes. And then the pool name below it. I can fix it. Go ahead, keep typing. Right. So he also has a jail in, uh, let's say, user uh, local jail uh, clam AV, right? He, that's his antivirus software. And what he wanted is for clam AV to scan the Z pool. Uh, so my, my idea was, hey, what if we null FS mount user data inside of uh, user local jail clam AV? But then it That's turned exactly... out. But then it turned out that only user data would be mounted, not D zero D one. If you do it, are with all data. the data sets mounted? Uh, all the data sets are mounted. Yes. So you know, it, basically, it would Wait. be like Z. Isn't NetFS a cross file systems? Yeah, I think it would descend, right? So. Apparently, it doesn't use our data. Let's but, but, but. check that. Then I... Let me uh, test that. Or the that yeah, I, I, did, question, I, right? I, I did try that today. It didn't work. Hmm. Okay. So I can also share if you want. Is there an all deers kind of like NFS flag? Uh, Which I don't recommend on NFS. I'm screen sharing a system. system. Uh, uh, you can screen share that. Got them system. Okay. Well, if you want, you can screen share. Uh, I uh, how do I do this? I you just do screen sharing. It should work fine. It should kick you out, or you just do a stop share on today. Yeah, because the security is, is is set to yeah. Is your screen share working? Maybe I should stop sharing first. Yeah, stop okay, yours first. Yeah, there boom. we go. There we go. Hello, Daniel. Yes, welcome, Daniel. Hey, hey. Hey. Uh, welcome, and we are about to get a screen share from Antrenik's colleague, Vahe, who ha is curious, and you may even have the answer. He's using a NullFS as described mm -hmm. in the doc. Share the Yep, we, we can see, see it. True NAS. And he's not sure if NullFS I'm, mounted uh, uh, the child data sets mount. are mounted. Go ahead. Im harca hete bir ne yeste pulunem ustelikte user ustelikte user so he he basically mount he basically wants to mount 
file all users data set inside of the jail including all the nested ones so including it right so so the child yeah so the child uh, the data sets are not being mounted inside of the jail how can you show us can you show us yeah, how show them out points yep there you yep. go okay. Uh, file. Mount directory, image in my jail. Oh. And what kind of a mount is that? Is that a knowledge mount? Okay. Do you need multiple levels? So, yeah, so he has. You... Or is there just one level or multiple levels? It's it's multiple levels. So there is there is there is let's see there is um, a file all users which is you want to mount okay, okay. inside them. Uh, so via inside of the all users is there a single level? So you know just all users and then uh, you a user name or is there like you know a level one level two level three inside of it? Actually, maybe the jail shell. So let's more. use as an example if you had one uh, data set. Yes, you are. Yes, there's a new jail image. We're going to mount our ads. We're going to route it. Can you? Can you? Can you? We're going to mount our ads. Can you type in mount? Can you type in mount? Can you type in mount? Command. Okay. No, no, just type in. No, no, no. Which file image? Mount our ads. Type in. Type in the command mount. I'll put it in chat. There you go. Yep. Okay. Mm. So that's what we see there inside so, the jail. That's from inside the jail. Okay. Yeah, can we you... don't have any additional mount points. Jail image are in mount. That's the okay. Can you can you open up? Can you What's open up? What's the enforce start fs setting of the jail? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Can you, can you open up a shell, but on the host? Mm. Not 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 it's in the jail. Jail, jail image you should now. No, no, not the, jail, not, the not, not, not the jail shell, the host shell. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. I've just reproduced his report that, yes, you do see the directories, but you can't Don't see the content, in... right? Yes. Okay, you see the it. mount point as an empty directory. Yes, the okay. uh, host operation okay. system is... Yeah, of course. Can you can you go? Can you go to the can you go to the shell and type in a uh, mount in here? I wonder how is it, how is how is uh, how is it mounted inside of uh, the jail from here? And can you grab the output? Can you grab the out output with the name of the jail pipe? So mount space grep pipe grep. Sorry, no pipe AV. grep. Yeah, back. No, no, no. With a no, with, no, not a dash. It's a pipe. Okay, and then delete the grep. It's in the chat, by the way, if you want. Yep. So, wait. Let's do it this way. So you would do. Uh, can you see the message that Jan sent in the chat? Mm -hmm. Um, the jail name is Plan AV. No, no, no. The, 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 your, your command is also wrong. So you want to type in mount, and then after that, you want to type pipe, not grep. You want to type in pipe. Okay. Not pipe yep. as in the pipe that you wrote. Vertical bar. No, no, no. Pipe as in shift and pipe. And backs. Shift slash. and forward Shift slash. slash. There, no. no, that's the no. right direction. No, no, no. No, the, no, no, no. The first one was yeah. correct. The first Check one the was chat. correct. Uh, can you in chat type? It's in chat. It is, it is in the chat. Okay. Okay, and you have an extra mount, by the way. And in the in not regex, type in what was the jail name? Clam AV. Clam AV, yeah. Clam AV, yeah. Just even clam, clam is fine. Uh, okay, great. 
Yep. So, just gonna say no, no. Yep, perfect. So, so I don't see the null FS mounted, if I'm not um, mistaken. It isn't. Yeah, so. There is no null FS yet. There's no null FS yet. Interesting. So wait, but how is how is FreeNAS mounting it then? I have no I don't understand that yeah. part. I saw it in the config, but it looks like maybe it's not enabled or something. I saw in the jail config a few mount F, F, null FSs, but they're not showing up in the host or the jail. Yeah. Maybe they haven't been configured when the jail was started, so So I guess just click jails to the path to the clam A V. And okay. uh and then mount points. Okay. It's, it's running. It's not this all user, it's a jail image, I can aim in the directory yep. file image, mount as you know. Huh. Uh, wait a second, is the destination supposed supposed to be relative or? I'm not sure. Good You're question. not sure, right? Yeah, me either. But it definitely didn't mount. So um, that it may be worth trying it both ways, relative and not. Yeah. Okay. So so the data set inside of IT is not visible. For example, if there should be a file a directory called Vahe Vartanian, which is not available in there. But but I'm 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 not I'm I'm very confused about the user interface, you know, because is the mount point supposed to be uh maybe we should do it manually instead of uh, relying on free NASA's interface? No, I wouldn't worry about that. It's extremely okay. proven, but if it, we're not seeing it here, we're not going to see it further, so... Got it. I, um, I, there could be... So, if you set uh, nfall start fs to 2, I think the jail will not see its uh, submount points, which is why you want to look that up in the jail settings, but you would still see it in the grab command uh, where he shared... Got it. Got it. Well, let, let's change the uh, enforcer stat maybe first and try to figure uh, out from it's there. It's probably set correctly by default. Vajan, but... can you open us the, uh, 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 not the mount post, just edit the jail. Mm -hmm. You'll probably have to stop it before doing that. Uh, no. Sure, yeah, stop it. Yeah, that sounds good. It... <laughs> Michael, do you know happen to know if modifications to the mount points are applied while the jail is running or just on next start? So the I'm pretty enforce... sure you need to stop it first. Yeah, yeah, because it's as, like fair. As far as I know, okay. the uh, the what's the name? Uh, okay, so, doesn't, uh... doesn't utilize the dash m command at all. The the modify flag. Okay, uh, let's see. Looks like there's nothing configured, so it depends on what they're doing by default. I would mm. assume that they let you see the mount points after translation, which is a safe thing default. So mm. now if you start it. Is mount mount point there is a sensor towards the CD cut now. Okay. Okay. So MNT file is the Z pool. And MNT system is IO cages the you know IO cage jail, but uh, I, I guess can can you do like action new? I guess mm -hmm. that would make one. it. Oh, so it's it's yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. It actually. is, and countless Plex users are using this around the world every minute of the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. This is definitely not. So we can assume that either NLFS is not working or what's the other option? Maybe we should look into the logs for any error messages. That 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 could sound yeah. interesting. That could Given sound that interesting. they didn't mount and we don't see them on the host yet, because <laughs> there they are. I'd almost say carefully walk through them and both as is and with relative paths. Vajan, can I control your screen? Oh, are you connected using a web browser? Yeah, I cannot control your screen. Never okay. mind. Well, maybe you two take a moment to run through this together, okay? 
Yeah, but but uh, from my understanding, Vahe didn't do anything wrong, right? As as like from a config point of view, as far unless as unless relative tell. paths. I'll do a quick search on that. I, unless uh, relative paths. Ironically, okay. I've done, <laughs> I do very little with jails in TrueNAS, ironically. But yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, uh, Vajan, thank you. We'll, we'll have a look into it maybe at the end of the call when me and Jan stay for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. There's There's that. that. Okay. I'm searching as we go. So anyway, uh, Jan, if anything, it sounds like you have a quick news report on package-based jails. We can't hear Jan, by the way. Uh, so, uh, sorry, I was muted. Oh, no worries. So, um, I reduced my uh, package set a bit to have jails around 200 something megabytes, which even on a small single core ARM virtual machine install in a few seconds. And just create them in the exec.prepare uh, hook. Did you encounter any surprises? Not many. Good. But I've been told that I'm not, that some of the things I expect uh, are surprise others. So that. So, and on the last point, I found some examples of the uh, jail configuration. And yes, it's a full path. So you have it right, but you want to verify each step of that. So let me check that I haven't broken anything. As in demo coming or just yes. syntax? Okay. And I would love to talk briefly with Daniel, if you have to run at some point, just about the state of IPv6. Are there any known blockers in the jail ecosystem? But let's take a quick hmm. peek at this. Works for me in production and has for a few years. Okay. But my use case is fairly um, limited. Yeah, I, the only the only weird thing that I've seen is that trusting, um, you know, the route the route advertisements, um, they work perfectly on reboot, um, but they but they don't seem to the the jails. Actually, it doesn't even matter if it's a jail; could be a host or a VM. Also, they don't seem to get the they don't seem to get the uh, changes, the updates to the route advertisements, but. Um, so service net IF restart, which is the old standby for mm -hmm. uh, reconfiguring your IP4. Uh, if you do that and then routing, your routes just vanish um, with IPv6. But a reboot works fine. So IPv6 picks up the route, uh, the, the DNS, anything you want uh, works works perfectly fine. And you don't actually even need to start the RTV, wait, RT OLD. RTV OLD uh, service. It works without that. Um, so that's what I do right now. Uh, I use, um, you know, I, I just put that one, hang on, I'll give it a, it's, it's literally, uh,
I'm hearing no audio. Is everyone fine? He's oh, typing sorry. Away. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, <laughs> always, it's okay. It's okay. Just typing. So yeah, so sysrc that, and then um, and then if you distribute um, routes from your server, which is also super duper easy, um, I have a FreeBSD server as well, so I can show you the other side. Um, for a more dedicated FreeBSD jail uh, hosting network, you can also um, embed the jail ID under a prefix in the IPv6 address so that basically the host has a prefix for its jail and it just uses prefix followed by jail ID as IPv6 address. This embedding simplifies things and works best if you have some one um, dedicate assigning the jail IDs because otherwise every time you restart a jail you get a new address and even if that happens it can still be worth it to have two addresses because this is IPv6 we can have as many host addresses as we want so there's nothing wrong with having a stable global address for hosting and a jail ID derived address for um, discovery and management if it helps Thank yeah you. I think that's perfect I think that's definitely a good idea um you can also play with and it so one of the most common problems which has happened already I think twice in this call and several times in beehive calls is that people misconfigure the FreeBSD network stack by retrofitting a bridge either for VNet enabled jails or for Beehive guests to an already IPv6 enabled uh, network interface. So rather than move all the IP addresses, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses to the new bridge interface when they create the bridge, they instead try to modify as little as possible from their old configuration and thereby violate the IPv6 definition of what a link scope really is. And this breaks all matter of things in IPv6 because suddenly link local uh, multicast, which is used for lots of things in IPv6, uh, doesn't work correctly. You basically build a split brain into your network. Um, yeah, is that what was happening? Was that what was happening with Dan the other week, a couple weeks ago? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's right. That makes that makes perfect sense. Basically, what he did is, and he's not alone in that. Several jail managers have been written with this invalid assumption that well, I've tested this with IPv4. IPv4 didn't break too badly, so IPv6 should just work, and it doesn't. And it's also wrong for IPv4, but only seldom used features break in IPv4, whereas in IPv6, the basic everyday con reconfiguration breaks. And the really uh, terrible part is that it oftentimes works until it doesn't because mm -hmm. it works until the NDP cache ever expires and then you can never repopulate your NDP cache. And actually, the, the, the same also goes for uh, IPv4's ARP table. I don't know if you guys remember a couple of years ago, we had the issue where the jails were not able to be pinged until a jail pinged once yes, outside. Yes, because IPv4 has such a sim uh, simpler definition of scope or no real yes. well-defined concept. As soon as the jail broadcasts its presence, yep. it basically starts working again until it expires out. So yeah. if everything is chatty enough, uh, it keeps on working most of the time, which is why it's such a terrible thing to debug unless you know what to look for. Yeah, but but apparently if you do set the IP on the bridge, I, I tried this on 11.3, I don't remember, whichever that yeah. I found the bug on. And then I set the IP on the bridge, and that issue just immediately went away. It yes, was that's like, because you yeah. now have the correct scopes. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's also good to know. And yeah, you are right. A lot of GL managers, when they use VNet and they create uh, yes. 
they create. Uh, Daniel, oh, it's so sad. Uh, do you do you have any stories to tell before you leave? <laughs> Sorry, I got to get out of here, but I'll be back. Okay, oh, we'll thank wait you. for you. Awesome. All right. Cheers. Bye. Yep. True. Uh, so yeah, and uh, yeah, a lot of jail managers do indeed like they do set up the uh, they set up the bridge and then they add the appropriate interfaces into it. Uh, but they never change the IP configuration from the let's say the EM0 interface to or the VTNet0 interface to the uh, uh, what do you call that the, the bridge interface. So that, that becomes uh, a bit problematic. So the most common way this is misconfigured is to have. A physical network card on your FreeBSD system. Mm -hmm. Start out using the system. Do let's say you have a rented server. You put an address on it, and whoever wrote the jail manager doesn't want to burden the user with migrating their configuration. Yeah, and instead just tries to minimally invasive add their bridge. And this doesn't work correctly. Yeah. It's a ticking time bomb as, and will, for IPv4, it may work for the actually used parts of what's possible with IPv4. For IPv6, it's only a question of when, not if you will encounter real work yeah. breakage. Yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. And Jan, uh, speaking of that, so let's say from you know, as, a, as a vendor point of view, so what I do is, uh, unfortunately, right now, we do set the IP on the uh, on the uh, interface instead of on the bridge, which is very wrong. But mm -hmm. uh, a good question so th that depends. I had is... Let yeah. finish. So, yeah. so my question was, if, if I'm using uh, DHCP, then the DH client should run on the bridge interface, right? Yes. Okay. And I verified the physical that interface last week. should yes. never have an address on it if it's a port member. Yeah. Okay. Br bridge member interfaces should never have IP addresses on them. Okay. They must be up and nothing else. What did you say? The bridge should not have an IP? Or what? No, the in? bridge member. member. Oh, member. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I verified that just last week. I had to up manually the member to get it to work, yes. but yes, no surprise. Exactly. Okay. You have to set configure the ports up and the bridge will take its Mac its default MAC address from the first interface. If you turn it up oh, before it has know. one, it will randomly generate one. So if you always add your physical network card as first member interface, you have a stable MAC address, which oh, should okay. be globally as unique as your network card's MAC okay. addresses. So okay, unless that's... you have all 3COM 100 Mbit cards <laughs> in the trash pile, it should work, or cheap Chineseium. Okay, well, that makes sense. That makes complete sense, yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Please so check my work one of here. the uh, often overlooked features, despite the fact that it's documented in the rc.conf uh, manual page, is that there is the create arcs underscore, so create underscore arcs underscore, uh, and then interface mm -hmm. name uh, variable in rc.conf, which basically allows you to pass extra arguments to the cre creation of cloned interfaces. Create arcs, so. Create underscore arcs? Yes. Okay. It's documented in rc.conf. Okay. How the hell And that you... way you, for example, can uh, set the MTU uh, immediately or enable or disable, uh, mostly disable, uh, problematic offloading functions the moment you do something with an interface. Or if you're on VTNet, you can also disable the RX sum and TX sum, which becomes problematic with PF. Um, no. Create arcs is only evaluated when an interface is cloned by the RC script. So if oh. something does create, so, okay. for example, if you create a VLAN interface, uh, you have to tell it its VLAN number. 
Okay. So Something this like this? Wrong. It would be such as VLAN, <laughs> lag, <laughs> bless you, bridge, etc. From the main page. Speaking of VLAN management, when I do <coughs> lag and VLAN, should I set the VLAN on the lag or the VLAN on the port? I would create the lag and then the VLANs on top. Lag and then the VLAN on top of the lag. Got it. Okay. And never, ever create a spanning tree enabled bridges on top of VLAN interfaces. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, what happens in that case is uh, a real a nightmare situation because uh, you will start speaking spanning tree inside tag frames. Yeah. Which, depending on the switch vendor, different things happen. <laughs> it can be that they will just put the port into forwarding mode, the switches on either side of the afflicted hardware switch will the previous machines will think, oh, we are directly connected and it's reality where you have just left the loop open. And uh, but we're spending three nodes saying everything is fine. Or other vendors will just disable the port and not even tell you really about it. Uh, or just crash. <laughs> yeah, different ways of pain and suffering. Mm. Because these spanning tree protocols have been devised by switch vendors mostly, and they wanted uh, the VLAN aware spanning tree to be done underneath that the VLAN tag isn't is inside the BPDU frame. So that basically you're sending untagged a frame telling the switch, hey, switch ASIC, here is a control message relating to this VLAN and not that the switch ASIC has to look inside the VLAN for control messages. And Michael's next line is a very good one, mm -hmm. which is, you know, IPv6 is still experimental on Docker while it's quite mature on FreeBSD. Yeah, but there are other uh, runtimes than Docker. Uh, Portman and the like do support it. Oh, really? That's very interesting to know. So uh... there was a post just today of like Potman Portman ported to J Pod, or FreeBSD. Podman. Pod or Pod, because that was also the confusion. It's a D with a e Pod. Podman, yeah. yeah. So okay. uh, actually, Podman is written cross-platform, so it was always compiled on FreeBSD, but it didn't do anything. Uh, now okay. it does. I don't know what it okay. does, but uh, someone I, I saw a post of Podman now supporting FreeBSD. I don't know what exactly. It's definitely not running jails, as far as I can tell. But uh, if, mm. if if you have a link to the post, the mic. I'm looking for that right now. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Um, let's see. That's why I use Pocket, so I can bookmark stuff. I, yeah, of my many, many platforms. <laughs> so. Does someone have a two-second description of Podman? I've... A Podman is a, a is a Docker CLI compatible. So you know hmm. you can just alias Podman to Docker if you want to. Uh, container engine. So it 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 manages C groups and stuff like that in order to run containers on top of uh, Linux. And it's also uh, OCI uh, compliant. So you can run uh, OCI com OCI compiled OCI compiled OCI OCI manifested uh, okay. images on top of it, such as Docker images, etc. Okay. Um... And it's IPv6 on all platforms? I don't know anything about that. But uh, Jan, okay. do you know if Podman is uh, good with IPv6? Podman. I've is... only heard it from 
Linux users, I haven't run myself, but when people have been joking about FreeBSD so far ahead, we have IBV6 for years and you're considering implementing it, you just told me that, uh, well, no, uh, it's just the Docker thing. Other executors do support it, hmm. whatever the terminology is. This is but from... Yes. This is from uh, Red Hat, yeah. and it talks about that Podman 4 has IPv6 with what? With two tools, NetAvark and Ardvark. I thought we had bad naming in FreeBSD, but okay. Um, uh, let's see. what. How does this work? Has Network Backend CNI... That change that to this thing and then okay so you need some kind of a network manager i want to say that would you know enable ipv6 apparently yeah there you go podman network create podman one yeah but is are we in the same problem here again because docker does have this problem which is you cannot have ipv6 and ipv4 you can't have dual stack containers basically as far as i can tell Apparently, Podman is kind of. I don't the same. know about Podman, but I know that uh, it's possible in some Linux container solutions, not maybe not in others. And the their common solution is to do it by having the uh, encap the layer two encapsulation in between, and then the feature we really provide is Ethernet yeah. and a way to use it. Yeah. So basically, uh, static leases and stateless auto configuration using uh, EUI yeah. 64 or something so that you have a known yeah. address well well this 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 thing no apparently podman does have dual stack there you go so here's a network named red hat which is a bridge driver so similar to well, our repair bridge and it has uh, both ipv4 and ipv6 subnets yeah i think i think it's doable apparently it's doable and then you have ipv6 enabled dns true etc cetera, etc cetera. so i th I, th I think dual stack is possible and in podman Although I've never seen that on Docker, at least I've I've heard people complaining about the lack of that on Docker. I don't know if it's been fixed, but this is good to know. Also good to know that we have a way mature IPv6 platform. Yeah, and in the back of my head, I would love to just kind of Again, pretend we, we IPv4 community. goes away gen, just January first, and like, what would we have to do to really get there? So it's like what partly is, academic, partly practical, practical. Just uh, you. Remove the INAP uh, from your kernel configuration. Yeah, exactly. And system configure, <laughs> and that. rebuild and find out that you can no longer fetch your That's exactly from that. GitHub. Bingo. And I did a quick search for like large sites that are still not ready, and it's it's fascinating. So. So, so you brought good. up that uh, page. Yeah, that's surprising. I'm curious who's behind that. Let's take a look. DT, yeah, the the uh, app jail uh, app jail author. Okay, and lots of cubes and oh, yes. okay, so it's good. That's, no, th this this we page should verify is good. for accuracy. Yeah, awesome. This page is good. Also, app jail is a Docker style, uh, you know, tool in the sense mm -hmm. that it has a a app jail uh, make file and stuff like that. You know, so this is this is good. Also, they have you know supervisors, which is good. No, yeah, this is this is a very good page. This is a very good good page. Do we have Wikipedia style badges in our wiki? Can I put a badge on this? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, this is this is very much very well. If you like what you see, put a badge on. Um, okay, I should run. No, worries. I'm not in any way discouraging you from continuing, but I'm very glad we touched on the the reviews. If I was to go down my wish list, the one thing I'd want is. Uh, a syntax example from Shavon's Shavon. new work. It's in the he, man page. Okay. And uh, his diff. Excellent. Oh, review in Fabricator. So I'll just push him to the top so we don't miss it on the yes. minutes there. Thank you. So. Um, because yeah. also bearing the lead, congratulations, it got merged, and I hope it's IPv6 friendly, but. Uh, it is. It is. Yeah, we At talked least about it used that. to be. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, we did talk about that. It is IPv6. And 
as far as I know, even this is this should apply to Linux containers as well. Ah, good to know. Because yeah, cause of course, uh... the Netlink is just a wrapper around our you know ioctal based system so as far as i, I can tell it, it should just work work fine with linux containers as well so linux if config should not should not be able to uh set an address that is not that it is not supposed no, the to. linux system calls are translated no. into the freebsd uh api inside yeah. the kernel yeah. so it's only a different entry point to the same validation code yeah it's perfect this is very much very well done yeah. Uh, the man page part, right. Apologies. Yeah. Uh, this is the test. There is a man page. I'm 100% sure that I saw it while I was reading the code. Mm. Uh, but I do not see it here. But I'm pretty sure that I saw Oh, there you go. There is a man page. Examples. And here you go. Here are the examples. Oh, perfect. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, rules, AFNet or AFNet 6, AFENet 6, et cetera. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, there you go. Here's also an IPv6 example. So, yeah, this is, this. we have a complete examples and everything. So, thank you, Shavon. Without these, yes, exactly. Thank you. And without these more fine-grained limits, what could you restrict? Like, jail can't set an IP, yes or no? Or now you can... So allow range or allow, explain it to um, our users you can have a list of prefixes so it's prefix based not range based so you have to align your allow deny according to uh, some length of net mask the assign dot 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 line there so what uh, one of the uh, interesting ones is that uh, Jan, would this technically work with DHCP as well? Yes, because uh, DHCP uh, isn't magic. It still has to invoke a system call to change the configured addresses. It's a user space client which learns about the address and then applies yes. it. I yeah. don't know about what happens with in-kernel processing of... Um, of router advertisements, but 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 so uh, you... technically now the rule would be that the the the, the jail should have kind of uh, two filters. One is that it can assign itself a zero 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 because what that's what DHCP client uh, assigns itself when it's doing the request, and after that when it gets the IP, it it actually sets the IP. So now we have a rule of the range of the IPs that it can set yep. itself and 0, 0, 0, 0, right? So if you, if we have both of these, it should work fine. But if we remove depends 0, 0, 0, because okay, um, it depends on how you're doing at the DHCP client implement. Because if you're using uh, Barclay sockets to bypass it, you don't even have to bind the all zeros address. Oh, okay, got it, yeah. Because, uh, but then you have to... Uh, Depends on there are multiple ways to implement a DHCP client for a single interface. We're talking about our own. I don't know which uh, code path it takes or if it even supports Got maybe it. multiple ones trying them in sequence until one works. Or... Got it. Okay. I see DHCP as for effectively forked by FreeBSD is the very definition of a legacy uh, application. <laughs> Okay, that sounds good to know. Okay, well, uh, congratulations. Now we have two things from our community, right? We have the dot .include and we have the IPACL. Yes, and hopefully a few more out of these bug reviews just to push things along. Sounds perfect. Yep. Sounds perfect. Uh, Michael, are you going to come back? Uh, I need to pack and hit the road. Got I it. have Got an it. anniversary today. Oh. Uh, so congratulations. thank you. Good work, everyone. Thank you. Um, I will step away, but I'm not discouraging you in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. I suspect that Vahe's issue is pretty simple. It somehow the mounts were just not showing up at all, but that's a very um, proven part of TrueNAS. So I'm not worried per se. But but Jan so, was able to reproduce. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's easy. Uh, it. So just at what ha it's exactly as Vahe described. Yep. Uh, I assumed it would be different, but no. Um, 
null fs does not cross uh, mount point so you have to null fs mount each sub mount point uh -huh. and it, but if there's only a single level like for example for home directories where you have a home mount point with one mount point per user yeah uh in that Fixed case orgs is the answer have, hmm? X orgs would be the answer to that. No, even better. Auto oh. FS with a uh, oh yeah with, with a script as mount map yeah. to enumerate the uh, the original one and then auto mount the null FS is on demand. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Thank you. And you can use a script uh, outputting the this like the media examples for slash media mm -hmm. in the base system. Uh, there is already code like that. To uh, f if you enable it, make it possible to mount all the commonly understood labels for uh, FAT32 USB sticks by just going to slash media label and then have it mount. Of course, that's a giant attack surface, but it's convenient. And it's a very good example because it would basically do the same thing. You would run ZFS list with a dash uppercase H to get a script-friendly top-separated output. Yeah. And uh, the, M Michael, where you said, where you typed in, do not try to share all DIRs with nested data sets over NFS, what happens? Like, does, does the system so, crash? Yeah, it, it just gets very confused as every, as a OS and applications, everyone's like, why am I seeing the same few low numbers of inode numbers over and over? Right. So I forget right. the exact issues, but just, NFS is very unfriendly with nested but, ZFS. Uh, not uh, with uh, NFS v4. Ah, because resolves it? NFS v4 doesn't have the thing that you have to mount each sub data set. NFS v4 does work across mount points. With the recycled inode numbers from ZFS for, per data set? I don't know how they solve that one. Maybe they use okay. the larger file handle namespace to embed the mount ID. I don't know. Well, but we have it's... we have Vi here, so we can try on his lab. <laughs> That's right there. Um, Keith thing. Um, but uh, 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 one uh, option which would be even easier to integrate uh, and wouldn't require messing with the TrueNAS host system. TrueNAS is a file server and um, you could just use uh, a NFS before to export it, the file system you want to make available, and mount it into the uh, jail. Uh, NFS Vahe, uh, are you using NFS or are you going to use only Samba? Because Samba doesn't have that problem as far as I know. Samba has a lot of different problems, but... <laughs> that is not one of them, lol. <laughs> exactly, I have 99 problems. <laughs> um, point of trivia when they call data sets file systems they actually mean exactly this like your inode numbers start at zero and work their way up so you can have a whole lot of inode zeros on a system anyway sure uh, that's but the same would happen with ufs or fat yeah every file system has its own uh inode namespace Yep. Unless you're talking about strange special purpose file systems with some kind of pooling behavior yep. or snapshotting behavior. <sighs> okay, good to know. Okay, I got to run. Keep Thank at you, it. Michael. Have a good uh, anniversary. Yeah, just... Thank you so much. Take care and uh, ping me if you need me. Cheers. I'll, yep. be, on, I'll be online, but uh, not within super reach for a meeting like this. Take care. No, do something social for like <laughs> once. <laughs> this is social. Come on. Okay. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> so, uh, Jan, uh, I have a completely booted Linux system. Uh, this is my script, by the way. Uh, do you want to go mm -hmm. into it or are you familiar with this? So, I have mm -hmm. a, a Linux a jail that yes, okay. is using VNet, and okay. I'm also nice. using Mount FS tab. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the Mount FS tab looks as it was written from the wiki. I I, I took the exact mm -hmm. one. Okay, so you, yeah, okay, what Linux expects. So, uh, uh, Rock FS, temp exactly. FS, FF, exactly. Yep, yep, exactly. And I'm using Dev1, you know, the Debian mm -hmm. fork, 
because uh, it doesn't mm -hmm. have systemd. I couldn't get systemd to work no matter what I tried because it keeps wanting to bind, bind, bind to PID1, uh, but they have OpenRC in Dev1. And uh, instead of running mm -hmm. SBIN in it, I'm running SBIN OpenRC and asking it to True. run the default uh, run mm -hmm. level. And in the shutdown, it's just running the shutdown run level and everything works yep. flawlessly. Of I, I could even get PF me. to run. Wait. Can you imagine that? You have a PF utility inside? Yes. Oh, of course. If it's not tagged as Linux, then it works. Yes. Of course. Yeah. And it, that that one also worked everything as, as expected. And uh, I yeah, have exactly. No it's not branded as a Linux and executable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And because yeah. of that, it uses the right uh, ABI and can yep. just talk to PF. Yep, and everything is working fine. I'm having no issues so far. Um, uh, I, I basically what I did is for uh, administration purposes is mm -hmm. that I have a slash rescue of uh, mm -hmm. 3BSD uh, either copied or mounted into the jail as a slash native. Mm -hmm. So now in case I need I'm, the native tools, it's already in there as well, uh, statically compi um, compiled. I'm working on a solution for that, a generic okay. solution, which doesn't require teaching each tool to uh, attach to a jail at the right point. Okay. The idea is that uh, we have this nice system called fxecve, which doesn't execute. Uh, so basically in Unix, you fork a new child process and then you exec an executable. Okay, so fxecve, which is... Yeah, and fxecv takes a file descriptor to the file to be, to replace, basically to be the replacement for the current process. So spawning a new child, for example, if you run ls in a shell, what happens is the shell forks and then the ch fork child exec to become ls. That's interesting. And this is how it always worked in Unix. And normally you have to pass it. The, these are the two real system calls. There are a bunch of other exec like functions. Mm -hmm. But in the end, they all call, call down to one of these two system calls. Normally only the upper one. Mm -hmm. And that takes a path to the tool to be executed. And of course, you can't do that to execute a tool after you have attached to the jail because you can no longer look up a file in the host. Of course, but with fxxv, you can? With fxxv, you already have a read execute open file descriptor to the command right. you want to run. Right. So, so the idea is I want to write a, tool, a little tool which takes a um, command line looks up the command you uh -huh. wanted to invoke okay opens it okay attaches to a jail okay and then links and runs the tool inside for links the longest time runs. i thought okay. the problem is that these days all your commands except for the ones in slash rescue mm -hmm. are uh, dynamically linked so what really happens when you exec uh, into a new program image is that you exec the kernel finds out, oh, this is a dynamic mm -hmm. executable, and the kernel will instead exec to the runtime linker, yeah. and the runtime linker will, through low-level calling convention, find out which image you want to link together so that you link in the libc, libmath, libfrets, and so on. Yeah. So this is and, actually very interesting. The problem so, is that so... this normally happens yep. also using paths. But yeah. I just a few days ago found out that the FreeBSD linker has gained support for overwriting the um, the um, the paths to look up by using a environment variable listing a, a colon separated list of file descriptor numbers for directories, so that you can also take your linker lookup path into your, a file descriptor as well into multiple file descriptors and and uh, code in an what, environment variable for the which runtime man page linker. is that rtld rtld that's the runtime linker okay yes and there you can have the ld uh, library something not not this one uh, ld uh, something fds not preload fds but 
uh, any FDs. library paths FDs. Preload which FDs overrides and library paths FDs. Got it. Exactly. And this was developed for Capsicum. Yep. But yep. Now I, yeah, I see the value in here. Yeah. Yeah. So it's required that uh, to uh, exec uh, dynamically linked executable from inside a Capsicum sandbox. But you can also use it to uh, exec an executable using libraries and so on from the host in yeah. a jail after having attached. So let me go with the steps here. So your program starts, it gets the first argument as the path that you want to execute. Let's it decodes say... the, no, the first one is probably the jail, okay. followed by the rem rem remainder as yeah, commands of course, to of course. The... Of course. So it knows the jail and it knows the command. Let's say the command is a complicated one like uh, SBMPF. Because uh, you know, PPM no problem. It is is it has multiple. It has like I I think at least three or four libraries, libnv mm -hmm. etc. So it knows that, and when you open it, you can know which libraries it needs. You open the libraries as well. I, and no, that, no, no, no. I don't oh. have to do that. Okay. Instead, I look up the current uh, default, or I just have hard coded for the, uh, now the default LD library paths. Okay. So this is stored in var live. It's a bit annoying that there's a command line tool which can dump it. Okay. LD uh, config. config. Yes. Um. So there's a LD config dash R or something. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, so you're not opening the library. You're opening the library. No, no, directory. I'm opening the all the directories the linker okay. will link expect. Oh, okay. uh, now I got Sorry. it. Sorry. Okay. And then tell it to use the basically so take these file descriptors to directories in the okay. order defined. Okay. To look up libraries. Okay. And then it will basically open them using open ed. Okay. 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 And this, since this is done on the f already opened file descriptor level, after mm -hmm. this you do GL attach. But inside the jail attach, your no. I do jail attach before I so I open the directories before jail attaching, and huh? I use the open ad uh -huh. after attaching. Yes. Okay. Got it. taking oh, the okay. capability represented by the obviously descriptors you, with not, me into the jail. Obviously, you're not doing the open ad yourself, right? Because like the the pf binary the is runtime the linker does it for me. Yeah. Okay, okay, of course, of course. Okay. So your program starts, it knows the name of the jail, it know or the ID, it knows the name of the binary and the arguments that you want to run. You open that, you open the file of the binary that we want to run, and then you pass the FDs of the you you you, or you 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 pass the FDs of the directories of the libraries. I don't pass them, I inherit them. In you in, yeah, case. you inherit them and then you attach to the jail and then you just execute. Uh, wait, no, stop. I don't inherit them because it's the same process. So okay. the, I fork, then I basically, or I exec. Yeah. So I don't create, a, basically the file descriptors don't switch process, but they follow the pro, as part of the process, Okay. they too, join the jail process. Yeah. Just like a jail process by attaching doesn't lose its standard output or standard input. And then after jail attach, you do fxec ve of the binary. Yes. Okay. Okay. And I have to open the binary as a file descriptor as well yes. before. Th that's why fxec ve, not exec ve. Yep. Okay. Well, I kind of could use it if I can trust the jail to have um, uh, fdesk fs mounted. Yeah, no, okay, okay, okay. Got but it. that's no. uh, an ugly uh, solution. Yeah, this is very good. Uh, anything you would need to help in that? <sighs> that sigh was machine? so good. <laughs> A time machine, okay. So, no, okay, uh, this is very interesting indeed. This is very interesting indeed. Yeah, something else, what I um, I want to take it a step further for other reasons, okay. and that's to also basically make this available as a, think of it something like a mission between at and cron. Where okay. you have the, okay, you send over a Unix socket, basically 
everything describing a process to be started by a supervisor. Oh, so now you have a global <clears throat> cron that's running inside of the jails crons. No, I have uh, something like the building block for a process supervisor where everything which can basically be expected to fail has already been done by the client. And then the client basically tells the system that, yeah, please do this at this. You have basically the ability to pass a memfd for the argument vector, a memfd for the environment vector, mm -hmm. uh, an array of file descriptors. And then you can basically have this spawn the process with the process descriptor and then hand you back the process descriptor for the process. Okay. And this could be used to have reliable supervision without polling in a nicer way without having to go through the yeah. file system. Okay, got it. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, so so my, my, my next problem with this Linux thing is this one. Have you seen this? Uh, EPOL 1C. This is, no. this is being... EPOL CTL is used to modify the EPOL set. Yes, yes. Well, which, which we do not have a wrapper for uh, 1. Right, the one is the uh, is the value in the argument here. Uh, I don't know what this is. Oh, yeah, no, that's something else for now. So if okay, we go, so you have to... some problem that Epol isn't fully emulated. So three. Uh, where where do we put that? I think we put that in sys compat, right? Sys uh, compat. There we go. Uh, Linux, as far as or <coughs> bless you, and then it would be in Linux event. So we have the. Uh, epol ctl but there we go but i'm getting this error message in my uh in my uh what do you so call that in my d message uh, which is you know okay, epol ctl flag. unsupported flag then the flag is one so uh i think i need to modify this file and see what that yeah means. you have to find out what it's even what's the supposed semantics and how hard it would be to implement this yeah yeah, because 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 if we fix this or configure issue, um, engine X to use a different kind of um, polling, polling. Yeah, unfortunately, like I'm fetching these things from like Gen two and Debian Dev one, sorry, or Void, and they all compile engine X with the same way, which is it only supports a single type of uh, what do you call? Oh wait, it? they remove polar. select and poll support. Yeah, no, no, no. They they do have it. It's in Nginx uh, core. Uh, maybe I can find it this way. So, uh, so Nginx you should be able to configure it or exactly. Paul, yeah, or select exactly. somewhere in yeah, there. Yeah, um, fine tuning Nginx configuration. Yeah, that's a... e Paul. Let's put it that way. Exactly, there we go. Core yeah. functionality. Uh, use the Paul. And mm -hmm. the connection processing method. So they have multiple. They have select, which is you know the old, yeah, old school select. Yeah, that's the oldest one. Paul. Paul, the POSIX same compliant. Same performance Paul. problem, but not quite as yes. brain dead. KQ, KQ for us and BSDs and Mac. ePoll for Linux. Dev Paul for old Solaris and Event Port for new Solaris. So the problem is mm -hmm. that when people are building um, Nginx on their platforms, that being said, Dev1 and Gen2 and whatever mm -hmm. it is. They pass the without. They don't pass any of these. So select and pull Wait, are not available. Do you disable it now? Uh, they disable it in their packaging system. Okay, then you uh, are out of luck. I am out of luck. One of the easiest ways, so the reason why I want this to work uh, either on the FreeBSD compatibility, <coughs> bless you, mm -hmm. or, or find a way to modify Nginx post installation is because now that we can run OCI binaries, right? Docker images, basically. Uh, and uh, if we have Nginx, that opens up to a, an area of, you know, thousands and thousands of Docker images that we can run. Because, uh, you know, pe people very configured it with Nginx, right? So, you know, web applications, next cloud, blah, 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 the list goes on. So that, that might be a very interesting thing, you know, if, if we can fix this. And Daniel, 
uh, was saying the same thing when I was chatting yesterday is that like if, if we do that now we can have you know we can use something like OCI tar from Michael C from X the XSC utility where it will you know create a root FS of the yeah. uh, Docker images, but that Docker image is running Nginx, right? Uh, which which is not you... running properly right now. So if, if we can you... fix it on the Linux compatibility layer, we, we will have mm. a lot of Docker images that we can run. Yeah, go on. Um, you may have to also go over all the uh, ELF executables and brand them as Linux executables during import. I, I didn't have that problem at all, believe it or not. Uh, can be that it just works. Yeah. So what if I the did... auto detection works. Yeah. So, so I have the a... binaries of your distribution are tagged correctly, so that the kernel figures out that it's yeah. Linux, then it's fine. Yeah. I, I, I never. Elf is just to be sure. Yep. Yeah. I never had any brand elf issue at all. It was always working fine. One of my ideas was, is that, um, like from a jail vendor perspective, we could have Nginx somewhere, you know, like we can have a script that downloads the FreeBSD Nginx. And then the Nginx inside the quote-unquote Docker container is now running our Nginx mm -hmm. while everything else is running the Linux stuff. That's you know? an ugly... Um, it's a very ugly solution. Hack yeah. Because um, Nginx is heavily customizable. Yeah. And you can have modules statically or dynamically linked in. True. And patches added or removed. Oh, yeah. So they really pass in different default values for certain paths as build arguments and so on. So just uh, having, for example, if you replaced it, it would suddenly assume a, a FreeBSD uh, file system layout by default instead of a Linux yeah. one. And while you could override all of this, um, yeah, you're losing your, it just works transparency. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Absolutely agreed. But uh, m maybe the easiest fix is actually fixing it into the Linux compatibility layer in here. This is the uh, process that's doing it. It's epoll to k event. It changes the poll to a kq event. Yeah. And the, uh, it's, it's what's done. What's the in flag? Here. The uh, flag is, is 0x1. But what does that represent uh, symbolically? I have no idea. <laughs> is there a man page? Is that like manlinux.com? Well, how do you do that? Man7.org. Got it. Okay. This is uh, something from my history. So we want epoll a CTL, right? That's the one. Oh, it, it redirects you to Linux, to, to Google. Okay, well, that's, that's fine. Um, I already linked to... Uh... Oh, thank you. Okay, got it. Yeah, so these are, I mean, there there's no numerical value in here, but yeah, okay, I, I get your, your point. We should find what that numerical value is and then change that. Okay, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Okay. Depending on how hard the semantic is to map to what exists in okay, the cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I'll, I'll look into that. I would love to put that inside uh, inside uh, 14. That would be very useful feature, yeah. Just to have Nginx up and running. Uh, so yeah, th these were my stories in the last week. And I think that, that they were fun. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's see, anything else? Nothing on my end. Jan, anything else? Yes. Uh, do you have any more stories to go into? I I'm loving your... Um, um, can what I show you the... Yeah, do you have a, a jail utility uh, prototype? Uh, not just the jail.conf is enough. What do you mean? For, what? For the package-based stuff, just a simple jail.conf is enough. Oh, can you... Up, uh... Just uh, let me share my screen. Okay, let me uh, stop mine. There you go. Okay, we can see your screen. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do have to ask, what is the capital A, capital D values in uh, Tmux? Capital A, capital D, huh? sorry? You're running Tmux with, if, if you see the title of your terminal, it says Tmux new capital yes. A, capital D. A, D, O, um, A for just attach and D, uppercase D for 
A, attached to an existing session. Uh, D, detach anyone else already attached. So that will make take oh. over the existing uh, session and kick okay. any other uh, team attached to it oh, that out. session. Okay. Okay. Sounds yeah. Good. So that I'm sure that a new basically means new session. Yeah. New if it, it basically it's an independent version of make sure oh. that you're the only one attached to the to a session named jail. Yeah. Create it if it doesn't exist, otherwise kick out anyone else using it and show it to you. So that nice. you have have a window named jail oh. and it's the one and only viewer. So that you don't have the annoyance that there's an other window on a secondary screen flickering away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. Or you Good to know. have a secondary view to it which has the wrong size or you have a secondary view you accidentally bring into focus and suddenly you, you type into the other one and it's just comfort features so <laughs> so we're this is from inside the jail your, okay, this is from inside okay so so wait. i have to make my window a bit bigger so that you can okay read it on that the sounds line. fine so we have a domain, a path, a temp path, a host name, a base repo. That's the repository name, I guess. Okay. Yes. Base packages. These are the packages that you need. This is in a uh, multi-long string. Sorry, multi-line string. Yes, this is so that after the quoting, it's a single line. Okay. And okay. then this, this is your why. this is your OCD kicking in. Okay. <laughs> why? Which OCD? Uh, you know the the columns at the top, man. In the in the it's in just the... <laughs> yeah, um, it's just no. I just piped it through sort U and column. Nice. I didn't okay. do that by hand. <laughs> okay, okay. Then we have exec prepare. Uh, this is the one this that year showed us before. Yeah, make sure that uh, the path yeah, it's a bit smarter. So if the path doesn't exist, then it creates it under the temp path. Okay. Uh, defines the repository in there, then it installs the base system. Mm -hmm. uh, it installs the host system repository configuration, but it leads switch from quarterly to latest. Mm -hmm. then and and, and, I, and uh, why do you do uh, auto remove? Um, but can I ask you to uh, set, can you can I ask you to do set number in them? Thank you. So line uh, 34. 34. That's 33. Okay. So yeah, the auto remove. Why are you doing auto remove right after this? Uh, because page? sometimes they're just install dependencies, which can get basically to get rid of the tests package, which oh, okay. installs lots of tiny files, okay. which is pulled in during the install here as an automatic dependency, but then gets removed later because it's only in a uh, it's not a runtime dependency. Okay. And root dir is not the same as true root, right? No. Um, the problem is I can't share root into an empty uh, the system. Of course, yeah, yeah. Because there's nothing there to run there inside the share root. Yeah. And, and, because and, and, our... and, and when you're doing root dir, is the database of the installed packages saved on the host or inside no, the root dir? Inside the root dir. Perfect. Okay, this is um, awesome to know. I'm using attempt dir because while it's changed dir mm -hmm. here, I don't trust it. It's not in a jail, so uh, I create it under a temporary path before I mm -hmm. ever execute anything untrusted. Mm -hmm. And once I'm done, I move it over so okay. that the host system package tools aren't unleashed on onto a corrupted database with yeah. evil hooks yeah. installed to please run this hook pre deinstall when upgrading item uh, potent hmm? item potent no it's not just item potency it's also for safety okay. or security okay. that uh, the package tool isn't designed to be used with a evil uh package database yeah. locally so uh, root inside the jail could basically tell the modify the local package database yeah. and modify the deinstall hooks or the install hooks or something 
Ja, das so wird Package will then run Shell Scripts or Lua Scripts uh, during the install as okay. root. Okay, very interesting. And can I ask you, so uh, this is the base, right? This is not the actual live system yet. This is installing the base. Okay, that's why you do IPv4, IPv6 inherit. Not need. This is just a, a test gel. There's nothing useful in there. Okay. You would then now here, could, after here, at this point here, you could just do something like. Or root at this point. Yeah. Uh, install uh, whatever. Okay. Tmux would be a good one there. Okay. Got it. Got it. What the hell Whatever is Mosquito? Mosquito is an MQTT broker. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. Okay. And, so this, and this then is I the move base. This is something. So if you want to have fake jails, you would just do this per jail. Okay. Got it. And no, it would no auto provision on first creation. Oh, it would auto provision on the first creation. Okay. So let's you know, just. Let you me know, just I'll, I'll, you have a better jail manager than most jails, you know? <laughs> so basically here. And this is how fast it runs normally. Nice. Um, so this is what I do here, but um, I could also. So uh, it looks like a, uh, this for some reason didn't take. Why did that work? Let me. F uh, default, yeah. That worked. Okay. It did work. It did work, yeah. Does. Uh... Why does it still run? Uh, maybe I let me check. Da -da -dum, um. Okay. Oh, because the UTX service is dumb. Okay. So, oh. Uh, Enable. Let's see, does it still run? Yes. Okay. It's not, I wanted to not install the accounting service. Okay. Package. Okay. Maybe I should just include the package. Interesting. And and which 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 package based repository are you using? Is this your own or are you using? Yes, my, I just compiled my own. Okay, and you basically do PKG, uh, no, sorry, you do make package in user source and it would uh, create a directory of the packages in- You the... can use Pudir if you have a ZFS build system because okay. there's a tiny ARM virtual machines I didn't. Instead, I used- uh... <laughs> Something like this. Sign packages, package repo sign key. Okay, got it. Yeah, fascinating. Okay. Okay. And the result is. Okay. And that would be. And where did it get the URL from? Oh, you can see that. Uh, yeah, that's okay. what I did. Okay. I put, put and, it there. And, I have and, and where are the packages file. now? Is it like in user, uh, let's see, user so, object? So, uh, yeah, it's, let me check. User object, yeah. source, user object, user source repo. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. I wonder, does it... It's does, the easiest way of doing it and because it's yeah. just... Does it generate an index HTML? Or did uh, you make that? No, neither. Uh, I use the auto-index, but auto -index. I tell it to recognize if there, would there be an index.html or .html. Yeah. Show that, otherwise create an auto-index. Auto -index. Okay, fascinating. Very, very nicely done. 
So, so you uh, would you say that package base is ready? I don't know because I haven't used it in Angle for much. Right and now, I keep my so I haven't used it in production really. It's just on a test machine. Okay. I have found out that if you migrate an installed system, uh, it clubbers your user and group definitions and overrides them. Yeah. So you have to be careful during the migration, but afterward, during updating the system from uh, release to patch level one. Yeah. Uh, it didn't. So. Okay, that that's very good to know. That's very good to know. Okay, but so... the initial installation treats basically the files as roots in slash etc as not yet known to package uh -huh. management, and so it just moves the original ones under the suffix dot pkg save and suffix installs pkg what pkg saved okay save I think Sa okay. So these files you will sometimes find cluttering your system. Mm -hmm. And it's that the package manager moved your files which were in the way of package installation and were not installed by a conflicting package, but were just in the way when you installed a package claiming this path. I see. So it moves the file out of the way so that no data is lost. But it it still moves it out of the way so that a package can install and also interestingly well, in, in, also interestingly in low powered machines updating the system with package base if the uh, etc problem is solved would be a lot faster than using FreeBSD update not just in low powered machines uh, the package uh, sorry the FreeBSD update uh, tool is. Um, not very elegant really written because it's written in shell and has to call out for uh, all kinds of hash computations to child processes. So mm -hmm. basically it's a DDoS on your kernel just um, spawning lots and lots of shard five uh, or shard 256 child processes to inspect the system against what's there. And then yeah. the whole build infrastructure is just messy. And grown over time, and it's what's there. But uh, to be honest, in production, I prefer to just use the meta mode uh, on my bigger systems and just keep a populated object there around for updates because it's faster to git pull, uh, compile, world, and kernel and install if you use meta mode. You're saying that using that is faster than using FreeBSD update? Yes, on a okay. modern. So Proper server hardware, uh, basically something worth racking a 19 inch form factor. Yes. Well, I mean, because... for, me, for me personally, if like my beefy server. But only with meta mode enabled yeah, without it and only for updates because doing a major release update where you basically have to rebuild everything, okay, that takes like, depends on the speed of your machine between, yeah. let's say, five minutes on a monster machine and hours on a small laptop yeah, and of course. days on an embedded system, if you're unlucky. Uh, but um, this only applies uh, if you're really building the system from source. If you can make use of the uh, meta mode to have make only do the basically overhead of the make files, mm -hmm and maybe link a file or two here and there, you can get it down to two or three minutes. Uh, so, I mean, for the interesting one is that, there. like, from our point of view, since we're in Armenia, right, mm -hmm. the CDNs are very slow. So even on a slow Especially machine... Especially the... Yeah. Even on a so slow machine, how, it's faster how long to does do that. the update if you just set the pager to cut take? In Armenia on your network. So on, on, on a small on a on a on a on a on a patch level, you know, from yeah. release to P, it's 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 very fast, I'll be honest. But for a major release, it could take literally an hour to do that. And the problem is that FreeBSD update is is, <laughs> is the caching mechanism is not very well. So if you have like a 
uh, even not a beefy, like a regular machine, yeah. a server that has, let's say, 10 jails, mm. uh, running FreeBSD updates 10 times on the jails yeah. are One problematic. One of the nice things about packages is that... Uh, you can reuse the, them. Even better. Packages are um, transported over uh, anything which P the PKG can talk to, which means that uh, because it doesn't require a trusted transport channel, you can instead rely on the signature on the uh, repository database. Mm -hmm. So the, the SQLite database gets signed. Mm -hmm. If you look at the structure here. Repo. You get this here, this okay. mid, these files here, mm -hmm. and inside the was tarball, mm -hmm. I think, is a signature. Nice. And this, so you can even use something as old fashioned as a script proxy. Mm. Just and uh, it does at, le at least I don't know if it was tested after the move to curl, but at least with libfetch, it did uh, honor the usual old-fashioned things that NetRC and so on, so that you could have it use a, a HTTP proxy, yeah. and you could just point the, uh, the package fetcher to your local uh, HTTP cache. Yes. If you fetched over HTTP. Yeah. And that's and, and by also the way, possible um... for... The, I, or I did, you could I did, just run your own mirror. I, I did check. I did check. So uh, in the libfetch, uh, not the implementation, in the libfetch uh, usage in PKG, mm -hmm. there is a, um, a couple of uh, lines of code that still uses the environment variables. Yes, that... that also works. And you can also set them in the repository configuration. Okay. So if, oh. if you look here at PKG conf. Okay. And the PKG env. Yep. It's a dictionary, and it's it's especially designed to drive uh, libfetch, and yep. I think curl has similar features. Yes, yes, it does. So that you can have it here. For example, yep. here it sets your proxy. Yep. And then you can for update speed or just to be nice to the project infrastructure. If you run a thousand jails. Yeah. You may not want to, and you want to quickly update them. Yeah, it would be kind of unfriendly if you say, "Well, my data center has a redundant hundred gig." Yeah, and I have lots of NVMe storage. What about you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's awesome. So parallel That's good to know. updates with no jitter <laughs> on a blitz. Just as an example, let's say if, uh, I don't know um, someone like AVS would have auto updates at mm -hmm. midnight for all their customers. We mm -hmm. have it. That would just trash the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's nice. But yeah. Um, so let's see what else we have in here. Um, this is I, I love your I love your I love the way that you built your system. And and this is running on a beefy machine or on a. a Regular machine. This here? This is yeah. a one core virtual machine. Uh, Inside behind. Destroy. No, uh, by, on a cloud hoster. Okay. Okay. So now I will stop the base. Mm -hmm. Kill it. No, just. Nice. Uh, sorry, typo. And it will. Fetch, and it's basically install. now limited by. Yeah. Nice. It's now limited by disk speed, uh, yeah. writing lots of small files out. Yeah, and but and and, just... and and you also compiled the system on this uh, machine. Yes, okay. it took a while, but you okay. don't have to compile the base as much. I did. Uh, compile my own uh, packages just because I wanted to find out 
how uh, if a free, free BSD uh, legacy scheduler or for BSD scheduler mm -hmm. is still preferable for small systems. And yes, for interactive use, while there is batch work loads uh, fighting for the CPU, the old scheduler is definitely better on a single core system okay. because it isn't a constant time scheduler, but has a single global workflow and yep. spends a bit of CPU time. Uh, so you change it from the, yeah, ULE to uh, 4BSD? 4BSD. Okay. Crux old scheduler uh, still works fine for a handful of processes. Well, Crux old scheduler is amazing for teaching about schedulers. Let's start from there. You know? <laughs> like the yeah. code base is perfect for teaching classes. And the other part is that it's just fine. I need to think whether he was surprised to whether anyone was still uh, looking at it. But uh, it was only uh, a temporary uh, stand in until we write a proper scheduler. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so, so now, now it it's hasn't... doing the installs, right. And then it moved from dot base to base. And then oh, yeah, this is awesome, man. This is like perfect. Yeah, I'm looked into it because I want to to uh, play with Nomad and uh, Console. Yeah, and this is why I, I wanted to use. Some no, this is here. this is very good. This is very lovely. Very good to see. Uh, let's see. I I do have some questions. So, um, uh, uh, the 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 prepare flag, um, that one always runs, right? Yes. Okay. So I was wondering if I can. So here, here's an idea that I have from yep. uh, your configuration here. So you know how uh, we one of the problems that we had is. Uh, can I share my screen? Sure. Just take it over. Sure. So let me try opening up a terminal and uh, maybe I'll do it this way. Hopefully this works. Apologies. So let's see. SSH. Maybe I'll go to uh, this machine, I guess. And uh, let me share now. Sharing, sharing, sharing. Can you oh, see my terminal? I, yes, and I want to try some uh, crazy other idea. <laughs> so so, so let's say in here, am I using yeah. Jailer? I am using Jailer. Okay, so cat etsy jail conf this thing, for example, right? So this is a jail that's running. And for a long time, what Jailer did is that it got an ID, it generated an ID. This is a numerical, so it finds the first number that's available in your jail conf directory, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it sets it to a jail and then uses that for the ePair interface. So what I was thinking is maybe I remove this, the vnet.interface line, and turn it into a pre-start. No, sorry, pre-start? Is, is there one to execute after the jail starts, but outside of the jail? That's Sorry, a good question. Uh, so, there are, uh, is one for that condition, yes. So what? which exact condition did, do you care for? After so, we created? So, oh, it's called so created. Create. Okay, 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 okay. So yeah, that's create. the one you uh, want to use to set up. Basically, you could create the e pair, the pair, Either mm -hmm. in prepare, pre-start, or created. Okay. And then in created, you would uh, assign the interface to the VNet. Okay. But uh, Jail already has support for VNet built-in. So jail already has support for VNet built-in. Yeah. So the reason why I was thinking about using that instead of the VNet dot interface is it would be interesting to not have this ID oh. value, and instead this ID value, which is hard-coded in all of these places. Yeah. And instead, for example, doing something like this, like if config e pair without an ID, create, yeah. and then save that in, let's say, um, I don't know, uh, etsy jail.conf, what's this jail name? See something, right? So dot e pair, right? So I can save it in here, and then I can read it from there. Do, do you see why what... uh, do you want to do that instead of renaming the interface? Instead of renaming, oh, that's also awesome. that's, uh, that's try awesome. something. Uh, sure, sure. Sh uh, should I stop sharing? No, let, I will just okay.
So yeah, um, that totally works. Let me... Maybe you just uh, hmm? run e F config hmm? epair create. Epair create. Do I execute? Mm -hmm. uh, why not? Okay, created. It will tell you the interface it has created. Yep. Uh, normally, you could chain this uh, into a single invocation. Okay. You can try what happens on an epair if a special case is hot. Nothing danger terrible will happen if it okay. isn't. Epair create and just continue the line. Okay. You just ran uh, with name and then whatever, some name. Let's say uh, Crest. There we go. Yes. Name okay. Crest. Uh, there we go. Okay, so now I okay, have, no, I have crest problem, and epair yeah, three. The problem is that the other oh. one doesn't, doesn't get renamed, which is why you have to do it manually, okay. because epair is special, but creating one creates two interfaces. Oh uh, yeah. Wait, course, or can you see the other side on an epair uh, in a nice way? EPR then you could three. still use it. Uh, no, I don't think you can find out. The name of the other end. Yeah, that's true. That's a bit, that would be messy. Okay. Uh, but yeah, you can just clone the next three unit and then name them host dash jail name and jail dash jail name. Okay. Or probably use something shorter because interface names are limited to 15 characters. Oh, I did not know that. 15 characters. So it's 16. Bytes with one of them. Yeah, being sixteen the bytes, and the last okay. has to be the null byte. Okay, got it. Got it. And uh, be careful. The kernel has very few requirements on names. Names have to be unique and not empty, and at most fifteen bytes. And not, not until I, I, I don't. But think you can have names true. like backtick rm slash star yeah. backtick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like it, it can display an empty name in an e-pair. No, you can even have a new line or a tab or a space in an wow. interface name, uh, or even uh, shell special characters like uh, globs or um, dollar open braces or something. Mm -hmm. If you want to inflict pain and suffering on yourself, <laughs> you can. Okay, so I would. Uh, by the way, I published the second article about uh, WireGuard for jails. So my idea was if is I would do something like this, like e pair. Um, uh, wait, so I would do something like e, e pair create, create, then save that in the here with the jail name dot. Oh, sorry, I can't see my own terminal right now. I hate computers. Okay, there we go. So dot e pair like this, okay, and then it would go into uh, let's say um, um, if config. I would. At... I would. Go on, go on. The problem is that now you have to maintain this mapping in the file system, mm -hmm. which can get broken at any time by some stupid user running if config destroy. Uh, something okay and now you have a stale reference if you eliminate the <clears throat> the uh, mapping and instead use em uh, embedding mm -hmm. you uh, no longer have to deal with it you could just have it you even if you embed the jail number that's fine because you have embedded the stable jail identifier into the I interface have... name I have embedded the stable. Go again. The jail ID will never change inch over the lifetime of a jail. Yes. So it's you. You can update other properties of a jail, but you can never update the jail ID. Right. Okay, that's a good. So point. you can ha rename them to from e pair to just uh, host, and then jail ID followed by uh, on and jail. Name. Jail ID or something. Or GID. Okay, got it. Yeah, the jail ID has the advantage that it will always fit into 15 characters. But this totally worked, obviously. Interesting to know. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I can use this in the prepare segment, for example. 
What what I mean uh, theoretically theoretically what yeah, what you, what, if what you want what, to what would be the difference between uh, let's see prepare what would be the difference between prepare and pre start good question because <laughs> I mean from a technical perspective um, there is no difference I think right? the difference is that prepare oh and I, I do remember I looked it up in the code if I remember correctly oh. the difference is that. Prepare happens before the mount point processing of the jail command managed mount points is done. Oh, we start is done after the file systems managed via the uh, jail mounting instead of the uh, manual mounting of via so, hooks. So, prepare so, would be, for example, NFS mount, yeah, NFS mount, clone okay. is NFS nature. Pre-start oh, okay. would be once the file system is there, if you use the mount uh, property in your jail configuration, yeah, to have the jail command mount something in place. So uh, yeah. during pre-start, it's already there. Yeah. Then created is after the jail has been created, but before anything is executed inside the jail. That's perfect. And you have the start, which is started inside the jail, while created is outside the jail. Yeah. And earlier, but created is before start, obviously. Yes. Okay, that's good to know. So that's at that point, you have know. a jail, but yeah. nothing ins is running inside it. Yeah. Uh, which is useful for things like uh, LO interface, for example. Yeah, for example, to VNet an interface. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. To Got dynamically it. do this. So uh, something else. Uh, this is a really good example of where you would use t the trap built in, in shell scripts to mm -hmm. clean up after yourself. I mm -hmm. sent you the link. Mm -hmm. I'll, and... I'll open that right now. Mm -hmm. So stop. Uh, how do we make this work? Uh, I hate, I hate. Okay. Okay. Good. Copy link and paste and share and share. There we go. Okay. I want my cake and eat it too. <laughs> That's a very good title, man. So, uh, in, uh, in my first post, I went over how to do it with just what's there in base and just configure wire guard. And mm -hmm. now basically I re-implemented the FreeBSD compatible in my opinion, same features of WireGuard Quick, so mm -hmm. that you can use a WireGuard Quick configuration file mm -hmm. as is, and the WireGuard RC.d script auto enables if you have the configuration directory containing configuration files. So you don't even have to do anything to your RC.conf. You just drop WireGuard configuration files with reasonable names into mm -hmm. the directory mm -hmm. after you created the directory and it auto enables and just does it at the right point during the boot. Mm -hmm. And after all tells the NetAF script, which is normally run earlier. Hey, mm -hmm. by the way, please also do this interface. And uh, the, that way you can have static routing and stuff. Yeah. Just like any other WireGuard interface, uh, yeah. any other FreeBSD managed interface. Yep. And yeah, I couldn't stop myself using cheeky uh, chapter names. <laughs> this is a good one. <laughs> I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the script is linked to there uh, and there's the copy and paste compatible guide. If okay. If the reader is copy and paste compatible. Okay. That's good to know. But this is very good. I mean, this is a very, uh, very there's good... There's an example configuration. The key material, of course, is just used for the example and never used somewhere else. Nice. And uh, here's so, a good one. So uh, let's see if we look into... What do we have in here? Uh, this is your last post, right? Yep. This what do we have point. in here? How the parts fit together... CSRC, DevD. Yeah, I remember this one. I remember this one. Okay. Yeah, I no longer need the DevD because uh, now it's all hooked at the right places. Yeah. But I finally just accept that rc.d is a thing and 
it's the default and don't try to hide it just because it's not that perfect in its system. It's better than most, even if it's uh, an insane amount of shell. Okay. Okay. Very good to know. Very good to know. Did you post this somewhere? Yes. Uh, I, um, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, like Hacker News or Lobsters. That's what I meant. No, because this is a good one. No. Okay. Perfect. This is a very good one. Feel this free to uh, try. It's on uh, an hour of these tiny virtual machines. So if they hug it to death, they hug it to death. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, and you move to write freely. Yeah, it's self-hosted. Nice. Right. Single user. Okay. No, I think I could have multiple users on there, but okay, I didn't even put a varnish or something in front of it. So if it gets knocked out, I will look into that. Otherwise, just occasionally useful notes. Okay, this is good to know. What do you have in here? Nothing. Okay, you can't don't don't even have DNS. Well, this was very uh, good. I Let do me... have DNS, but and um... not not an A record. Yeah, there's not exactly. Uh, that's just a PowerPC uh, monomic for an interesting instruction. So let's do this. Uh, and awesome. But what, why I mentioned it is if you look, follow the link to the RC.t script. Okay, which is in here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And make it so that someone watching the recording can read it. Good. There you go. And look for trap. Trap. The world. There you go. Trap yeah. is going to the... run undo. Yeah. Run and undo is your function. The function is defined up a little bit above that, run undo. Mm -hmm. So what I do there is I have a global variable of you containing a stack of function names, and then they are basically executed on exit of signals. Mm -hmm. So that if something goes wrong, so yeah. for example, an impatient user presses Control C, uh, the shell script will abort and clean up the unrenamed interface it has just created. Nice. And yeah, this is something if you did would do something because jail just calls out to the shell, you could use the same approach. Uh, if you wanted to allocate your um, e pairs that way. Yeah. Do you think we should merge this into the base? Yes. Uh, did you send the PR? Not yet. I will... Okay. I finished cool. it yesterday. And... Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that hopefully next week. And this goes as a link. There you go. Perfect. Okay. I have no more questions. Uh, Jan, this was very useful. Thank you very much for the blog post. I'm very happy that uh, Dan and I have pushed you into blog posting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next time I should probably document how I um, use um, rebooting uh, on a single system. I don't so that I can have a system with an untrusted uh, system console or no system console at all and still full disk encryption. Nice. So should we continue into looking uh, inside Vahe's issue or into are which? we done for today? The, 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 uh, what, the, what was the free NAS mounting issue? Oh, no, we figured it out. It, it's, it's, it's a NullFS thing. Uh, yeah, NullFS doesn't work the way we would like it to work in this case. And uh, if it's not mounted, it can't work. I don't know why it's not mounted, but that's if there's a problem, it's a true NAS interface problem, not a FreeBSD kernel problem, because this is known to work for thousands of true NAS uh, users accessing their um, WARES collection like this. Is it that? Via Plex or, or something. So, or so if, or whatever they like to run. If, so if we have something like this, and this is mounted mm -hmm. somewhere, image, yeah, it's but... mounted in user local using nullfs. Mm -hmm. If I go to user local images, inside mm -hmm. of it, I should see 13, which it is there. But inside of that, it's empty. 
But in reality, user local jailer image 13 is not empty. Yeah. Right. Sure. So, yeah. So, so uh, if you uh, are comfortable assuming you will always have ZFS or something equally capable, mm -hmm. and that the um, base is basically supposed to be immutable, mm -hmm. uh, then you can just use clones and. For immutable infrastructure type tooling, clones are great. Uh, and by the way, can, can ZFS mount into multiple locations? No, each file system has one mount point. Has one mount point, okay. But okay. you can change the mount point property. Yeah, of course. And all its children will inherit that. And if you want to move that, basically change the mount point when a jail has been started, yeah, in the create uh, basically in the created step, or uh, you could m change the mount point property of some data set and all its child data sets if yeah. they don't have explicitly configured mount point properties but just inherit it, yeah, from its parents, then they would remount as well. So, so in um, this case, or would, would, let's um, say they would attempt to remount. Um, of course, mounting can fail for some reason. And can 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 AutoFS um, work with NullFS? Because I've only used it with NFS. AutoFS can work with file systems, but uh, it only mm -hmm. you need one AutoFS mount point per level, basically. You need one AutoFS mount. So okay, it doesn't so. work for re for multi multiple levels of nesting because uh, AutoFS synthesizes a mount point directory mm -hmm. because it's a synthetic file system. But as soon as another file system is then mounted before the directory is opened, mm -hmm. so that it's transparently mounted. Yeah. Um, afterward, any sub 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 directories hidden somewhere are hidden by the file system mounted over them. Yeah. So you would then have to uh, create a new one. But uh, if you look not just there for for the auto, um, what is it? Let me look it up. Uh, ETC auto FS. ETC auto FS. Yep, I'm there. There's this, there are special uh, examples there. Yep. Yep. Like a special, let's say, null, which is empty. Special. Yeah, that's a uh, dummy. Uh, but the media one is probably worth uh, looking at. Yeah, these are the scripts that it runs. Yeah, the important part is that the print scripts basically are run at mount time and they are responsible for printing out a configuration file to stand it out. Okay. Okay. So That's how it works. So Collude, for example, this is, yeah, we use this daily. This is my own. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is my own. We use, uh, what do you call that? We use uh, Ness. Oh, yeah. You mentioned yep. that you're still uh, yep. stuck uh, in the era of yellow pages, phone books, and yep. similar oh, things. Which, yeah. Because that's why it's called yellow pages, because in the US, phone books are yellow. Yeah, and I think like they had a, a lawsuit problem with the actual company that's called Yellow Pages, so then they changed the name yeah, to NIS, I... but the command is all stuck as, you know, y, 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 YP. You yeah. can't really uh, copyright a two-letter prefix. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That would be very interesting. I mean, don't give Elon Musk ideas, but I uh, even try. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, but uh, we're, we're we're pretty happy with yellow pages. We've never had any issues. Right now, I'm using <laughs> sudo with yellow pages. So uh, yeah, um, sudo dash i will actually mm -hmm. run u slash sudoers slash mm -hmm. one of these things, right? So, and this is included in there. So we're using okay. autofs, yep. I guess. Um, Auto... Yep, yeah, we're using autofs so, for home um, directories, pwd. There um, we go. I have taken it a bit to the uh, insane level uh, okay. just in a lab with LDAP. So in ports, there is open LDAP, the LDAP server. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is the bad old 
NSS uh, LDAP and um, PUM LDAP. Yes. These are terrible modules which should never be used. Yes, agreed. Be why? Because they link the uh, using DL open the uh, LDAP client and by extension OpenSSL into the process during the PAM or NSS operations. Mm -hmm. And let's say you do something ridiculous like find pipe X arcs start. Mm -hmm. So basically you start a start on each file uh, in a, your home directory or something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's a pathological corner case, but a realistic one. If you use these bad old modules, what, what happened is that they start up, dynamically link in an LDAP client, mm -hmm. do a TLS encrypted connection mm -hmm. from the client process because suddenly start is an LDAP client, mm -hmm. which does a TLS handshake. <laughs> We're talking about For a single stack, file, right? <laughs> yes, that has to look up the name. Yep, yep. And group names and so on. And for each, for that, it uses um, NSS. Wow. And if you use these bad old modules, every time you invoke start for a single file, libc contains libNSS, or NSS is part of libc, and it's implemented using DL open. And then the NSS module will pull in the LDAP client, which also means that every process, every user has to be able to connect and query your LDAP database. Yeah. So nobody has to be able to establish a connection to LDAP and read the user database. Okay. Which kind of makes sense as is how local it locally works, but suddenly either you have to basically put a world readable TLS client certificate in there, which is <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's a mess. Yeah. But there's a better solution. There is the NSS PUM uh, client daemon also available in ports. PKG search NSS PAM. Uh, yeah. And this, my friend, is why uh, you should always don't... run. Uh, that's just... NSS PUM LDAP D. Yep. So basically what this does The, is, the naming uh, is perfect. Advanced fork of NSS LDAP. It's uh, really... <laughs> what it does is uh, the actual NSS per operations are now done using only basically a similar thing to how you don't have a full DNS resolver, but only a stub resolver in Libc. Yeah. So what it does is... is there is a, a local daemon running on a Unix domain socket or listening mm -hmm. on a Unix domain socket and your NSS and PUM modules talk to this using a very simple protocol. That's very nice. That is very nice. And by the way... And um, this daemon maintains a long-lived LDAP connection so that you don't d burden your LDAP infrastructure with thousands of TLS handshakes per second under load. And uh, you don't have to wait for the TLS handshake before you get a reply. But the other nice thing is that um, OpenLDAP has an overlay mm -hmm. where OpenLDAP ca can speak the same protocol mm -hmm. over a Unix socket. Mm -hmm. That way, your server can be a read-only replica using the full Delta Sync REPL protocol of OpenLDAP to have your servers run a full replica of the relevant subtrees of your LDAP. Okay. That way you can have, for example, a laptop with you, and even without internet connection, you have a full copy of the LDAP filtered mm -hmm. by the replication. And it's a bit insane, but it works and it performs. And then I agree with that. Well, at this point, I can just async a plain text file and yeah. go back to trivial solutions again. <laughs> 
And that's yeah. Spelling, yeah. And, and what we also learned is that mm -hmm. uh, in in let's see it. I think it's in var uh, yp. So this mm -hmm. is the free BSD version, right? The make file dist, for yes. example. And these, these, both of these files should be the same, as far as I remember. Yeah, they are. So this is make file dist by. So this one yeah. that FreeBSD has does yes. not support OTOFS. Okay. It only supports AMD, the the old Ocho mount. Yeah, because nobody has touched the yellow pages yes. stuff. So, uh, for a decade before the new AutoFS was even implemented, I assume. we we actually patched it. Uh, can you still <laughs> see? It? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so your we the actually, last remaining yeah. master of riding dead horses. Ah, sorry. Let me see if I can even do this. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So we have in where was that var yellow pages. So yep. this is our database, but if we do diff make file and make file dist, uh, let's do it with them, you know? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. These are the changes that we have. So uh, some of the things that we changed specifically, here's a comment. So, you know, we changed the targets uh, to support um, uh, OTO master and OTO. You added your targets. Yeah. Uh, and we've also, and Norair, who I don't think he has, he's ever joined us here. He brought some code from his lab that was running Red Hat, not Rahel, <laughs> but Red Hat. And because Red Hat's version was a copy of FreeBSD's version, but then they added O2FS on top of it. So we yeah. we found the the least amount of changes needed that Red Hat did in order to make it work. So then we found those changes. And th this was it. This is pretty much all of that. This this one is for OTO master file mm -hmm. to be pushed into yellow pages. And this one is for the OTO U file, which is used for the, you know, the, the U directory, the slash U, which is for the user's net mounted home. Uh, it can be named anything else as well. But some I, I don't know why we hard coded yeah. it into um... OTO. Uh, although I think it's it's configurable, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the the target name doesn't yep. matter. Yeah, you can change that. I would area. just like to see if we uh, the resurrect uh, resurrect uh, Hesiod support using uh, DNS stack. That would just be so hilarious. <laughs> or DNS over quick or something. Um, yeah, because finally DNS can be trusted. Yeah, in theory. <laughs> But 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 I have to say uh, there's also another project I think it's called NIS plus. Yeah, <laughs> the re real reason why I don't like these projects is, and including his it is that you don't want to have a fast network database. Yeah, you want a local database exactly which is always available, which may go s slightly or even truly stale, but mm -hmm. you never want to lose access to it uh, because in all reasonable situation, a stale user database is better than no user database. And if you want to have some kind of dead man switch for a certain staleness for at least most accounts and groups, do that. You can which can be done using PAM. Just don't. Uh, just don't uh, <laughs> break uh, if the network's down. You don't want to yeah. be told, sorry, you can't re uh, fix your network configuration because uh, I don't know who you are. Yeah. No, but that, that, that's a that, very good point. That so, I mean, as far as I can tell, there is no way to make NIS have a copy of the local data, have a copy in a local database, right? It's always over. Unless the you run a local NIS server. Unless you're on a local NIS server that is replicating from the master. Yeah, right? and async over the files or something. Oh no, that's a, that's a, that's a very very dirty way, to be honest. Why? Just it's read only. Oh. You would just have your the point where you modified your point of truth yeah and then you uh have some kind of 
low latency replication mechanism you could run or you could run something like uh what's it called this core uh, with replication there's so many ways you could do it and yeah i mean it doesn't sound that and 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 does NIST support actual replication or is the real technique do, to parsing the uh, files i haven't used this in production okay i know that open ldap has local uh, replication at least it has different levels of multi master replication up to tracking the computing the diffs based on the staleness of the other nodes where you basically mm -hmm. track which version of this object is on each node and only send the compute the difference between these nodes and then you only which is let's say you don't just store your users but you also store photos of your users so that you mm -hmm. can print um, some kind of ID card mm -hmm. because you think you're that important as an organization and everything has to live in your add up then okay if if it's an image you probably don't want to replicate the, the print resolution jpegs of your poor employees yeah uh every time the servers reconnect it's so it's nice to know if they basically can have these fields already in sync so they're calling it delta sync replication yeah, well, apparently, I mean, <clears throat> NIST does have it. It's called YP yeah. push, and the yeah, but that's uh, exactly, no but it's uh, it's unidirectional. It is, yes, it is unidirectional. Yeah, I, so it would go from the master to the child, right? Not, not. Yeah, and the child children, I think, have to periodically pull in case they miss the push or something. Yeah, but I mean, there, there is a, a YPAXFR, so, you know, it's a, it's yeah. a differentiator. I mean, it's a, honestly, my only problem it's is... It's similar this, to is... zone zone replication in bind. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. But I mean, my only problem with all of this is, you know, there is no security layer, as in, you know, it's... it's well, SSL that, it's, that's easy to fix in FreeBSD. Oh. You can oh. just load an IPsec policy mandating that these ports must only be used with IPsec transport mode. Oh, all. I did not know about that. Can I do like if config IPsec create? No, it's a, it's a different command. It's set key to load a policy yes. and then the policy can say that uh, as soon as something attempts to use these, uh, the kernel will uh, talk to all uh, registered key exchange demons to please uh, set up a session and key tell the kernel the key for the session. Ah, so that there's something like uh, strong it is actually, or it is IPsec if create. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what? It is uh, if config IPsec create, yeah. Oh, no, that's something different. Oh, okay. The, I, the IPsec uh, create um, creates something called a virtual tunnel interface. Okay, like GRE. So, no, different. Historically, because you can also use, so historically, IPsec assumed that the vendors are stupid, the IP stacks are bad, and anything they don't um, push into the IPsec spec wouldn't be available. Okay. Think about it when they implemented. They were thinking about the Windows 95 network stack. How can we add a VPN to the next version of that? Oh. So that that works. And so because of that, we couldn't say, well, let's just use GIE encapsulation. That was around or similar things at the time or IP and IP encapsulation that existed, but they didn't uh, trust operating systems to have such things or routing support. So instead they cobbled it all together in uh, their preferred insane layering violation, which is um, IPsec tunnel mode. In mm -hmm. IPsec tunnel mode, IPsec um, is a really crazy, ugly, annoying combination of policy routing and uh, 
VPN policy because basically it tell you have your IPsec tunnel mode policy tells the kernel that basically to tunnel this uh, destination address or accept this source address from this tunnel peer. Yes. But there is no network interface representing this tunnel. So there's nothing a dynamic routing protocol can target like any other interface. If you wanted to make this dynamic, the routing protocol would have to know that, or the routing daemon would have to know, oh no, this isn't in the real route. This is an IPsec policy. Mm. Do that instead. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's insane. You basically can't use IPsec tunnel mode in its yeah. original form for dynamic routing. And yeah, what's used instead is you, you configure IPsec into transport mode where it doesn't add its own IP header <clears throat> and use IPsec transport mode to protect a GIE or a IP IP or similar tunnel. So how would that be done though? I mean, would I do like you uh... would create you would do the following steps if you want to do it securely. You would use the firewall of your choice. Yeah. To make sure that you don't accept or leak um unencrypted tunnel packets yep. if the policy isn't loaded. So what the easiest way is to just make sure that if you're using GRE and you're in charge of a network, just say only on the ENC0 interface is any GRE traffic accepted and everything else drop GRE if at, at least if one of my local IP addresses is mm -hmm. on e either the sender or the receiver. Mm -hmm. That can be done in like two or three lines of PF. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> IPFW can do it as well. <clears throat> then you have to uh, create the, unless you would want, just want to allow all GIE and say, mm -hmm. okay, uh, I trust the rest of my configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have to make sure that the, the states in PF created on the encrypted interface where you can inspect the traffic after decryption or before encryption um, you have to make sure that that part uh, where PF states normally can float around are uh, interface bound because otherwise if the, enc if the session is deleted the PF state would just move to your normal network interface and would allow the unencrypted traffic through. Yay. Um, so now you made sure that your firewall protects you from uh, mis most misconfigurations. Mm -hmm. And now you can define your IPsec uh, policies. Using set it key. used to be that using you had to do it using set key if you used mm -hmm. Raccoon, mm -hmm. which is annoying. Yes, and it is. But a strong swan can do it all in one configuration file where you have your policy and your peer information in one short file. So basically my NIS uh my <clears throat> NIS child then, and my no, NIS wait. master would have a strong swan connection between them. Without wait. Yeah, go on. You just I know I'm going off the deep end here, but so these are the two legacy modes, either tunnel mode, which in my opinion should be avoided mm -hmm. if possible, mm -hmm. transport mode, which is fine, but requires an additional tunnel. Okay. And then the cleanest solution has only come afterward. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, to just have um, the session ID be bound to an interface and then the key exchange daemon maintains that. And this is what the IPsec interface is. So it's a virtual tunnel oh. which has basically a receive and a transmit session ID. Okay. Be so a security association, uh, uh, sorry, so security policy index, SPI and security association index. So basically it's references one, uh, Outgoing and one incoming IPsec, yeah. let's call it session. Yeah. Um, 
It's what the rest of the world would call it. And um, that's uh, how it works. So, I mean, the, 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 the nice exam thing is that the example uh, for this, is... FreeBSD gained a nice feature yeah. in IPsec because normally before that, IPsec policies used to be uh, global. Okay. So basically, you could only have one policy matching all IP addresses yeah. per direction, which kind of makes sense. But now, um, IPsec policies can have different scopes, so they can be interface scoped. This is yeah. what's used for the IPsec interface, where you have a, an auto-created policy matching all IPv4 and all IPv6 traffic in either direction. And this policy just applies to all traffic going through the interface so that it gets encrypted or decrypted, meant always. Yeah. And the next step is that this way you can finally use tunnel mode in a sane configuration because on the wire it's tunnel mode, but it finally has a sane semantic. Yeah. That, 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 I love the example here, which is on host A, you just create the interface, you create the tunnel. <clears throat> so this is my machine, this is the other machine. Then you set um, an internal IP addresses. Uh, and then you just do a set key with some, you know, very secure that's, um Yeah, exactly. You should never use this example. Okay. Because uh, you should never reuse the key and initialization vector. Okay. Because uh, ISCBC isn't safe to use <clears throat> uh, to if you reuse the uh, initialization vector. E okay. You can only use each each IV once per key. And you also have to configure an HMAC to protect the traffic from corruption and you probably want to use uh, um, authenticated encryption with additional data mode mm -hmm. like um, yeah like um, GCM but that's all implemented and it performs really well mm -hmm. like I benchmarked it in FreeBSD 12 and it and my desktop didn't even throttle up to more than 1.2 or 1.4 gigahertz to saturate a gigabit link on one core. So mm -hmm. uh, it's fast. But it's annoying to maintain. Uh, you can also, if you're running FreeBSD 13.2 or aren't afraid of installing kernel modules from ports, you can also use WireGuard. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the same in uh, just no useless uh, configuration options, which always get in the way. And it's maybe a bit slower, but it's so much easier to use. And it's plenty fast. <clears throat> yeah. For Especially for synchronization. And the nice thing about um, WireGuard is that it can tie the IP address to a public key of a peer so that you have cryptographically authenticated the uh, peer address on the WireGuard interface, which make, means that suddenly IP-based access control is one of the most secure things you can do. Yeah. <laughs> At least for host authentication. Yep. <clears throat> which helps because suddenly you can really use things like TCP warpers or something like that and INAT based access control. <laughs> yeah. Which is how uh, I think uh, at least the old IPROPD and so on are supposed to be used. I want to type uh, Somehow so. we got into talking about NIS. So here's Illuria's patch to make NIS use OTOFS like a modern operating <laughs> system OTOFS instead of what was the other one AMD AMD, AMD modern operating Auto system or and, automating um, demon. the patch would be that diff right yep. so at least I should paste it somewhere for future generations to look at and uh, curse me yeah 
paste. On equal mansas. Oh, let me do it the proper way. Uh, like this. And then I would do like. And what else do we have? Uh... And this would become a. Uh... Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah. Just remove so some comments oops. from here. Did Vahi uh, fall asleep at his uh, machine or are you still listening? Checks targets borrowed from Linux. Sorry. And uh, yeah, that's it. And is this Illuria specific or is this as needed? No, everything seems to be fine in here. Everything seems to be fine in here. There you go. This is the only thing that we did a diff and then AutoFS started to magically work. Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. It's good. It's good. And then Auto yeah, Master so... also good. Yeah, no, everything is fine in here as far as I can tell. No problems. Yeah. Yeah. The, Sorry, you were saying something. The best uh, dead horse uh, one could wish for. <laughs> the best what? Dead horse to ride one could wish for. Oh yeah, yeah. No, but I'm, <laughs> honestly, I'm 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 really lo like so. I, I'm absolutely loving this for only a single reason, which is it's easy to debug and easy to get started. You know. But what's e e even easier is to use something like Ansible to just deploy it to the local system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I really want to migrate to LDAP. Uh, the story is that, you know, we, we got funding and yep. we had a lot of servers, but now the developers are having an authentication issue. So I just set up NIST very fast and yep. it, it was, you know, we spent a day on this but, patch, but then, but in reality, if we wanted to mm -hmm. configure LDAP, it might've taken longer because it's, it's not easy to configure LDAP. It, it really is not, well... uh, at least not to configure it properly, you know? Yeah, to learn how to do it, especially because yes. uh, it's not it's not an easy thing to master, and it's a lot of maintenance. And it, if it, if you do it in the always online configuration, which mm -hmm. is often recommended, mm -hmm. because oh, that way, as soon as someone is uh, kicked out of a door in an uh, US setting where mm -hmm. you expect to sell, sell, throw out all your developers at a moment's mm -hmm. notice and they may mm -hmm. uh, want to revenge themselves or something. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, they, uh, these are the situations described in uh, teaching materials Yeah, that it's important that you now allow stale accesses, but this also means that as soon as uh, something goes down, yeah, uh, everything grinds to a halt. So you're treating this situation as uh, the most important one and the real problem is if you're doing it in line so that every time you look up something you're hitting uh, the network yeah. suddenly operations which used to be read something from an always cached tiny local file because let's say this the page is containing the read only password database file so pvd.db or something Will yeah. always be resident on a loaded system. Yep. So your look up in a read only B tree in memory is exchanged for oh, let's dynamically link a library and hit the network, preferably encrypted. Um, yeah. So again, a TCP connection. So that's just your first two round trips. The oh, name look up as well. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly you have milliseconds of latency, even on site, for things which used to take nano to microseconds. Mm -hmm. uh, and the APIs aren't designed in such a way that this is a slow operation because a lot of time they can't be canceled. There are no temporary errors for please retry later. And there is no asynchronous version of the API where you start a request and get a response. No, it's always blocked with thread until I get a reply. Yeah. And the only answer is either valid or a fatal error. Mm -hmm. So it's a terrible API mismatch. Yeah. 
with good reason because you really don't want to support these cases mm-hmm. every t- time you look up a username belonging to a file owned by some user ID. Yep. But yeah. So basically, if you ever want to revisit your NIST setup, I would recommend looking directly for keeping a local replica of your user definitions instead of um, doing it any other way, basically. Yeah. It could really be having some kind of job scheduler run Ansible poll. Yeah. This is the most flexible and slowest way to just have some kind of job scheduler push the uh, the job to pull the uh, database files mm-hmm. via mm-hmm. um via async or something or just yeah there's so many ways to to do that yeah and i do wonder if um let's see where do we have password i didn't change anything there even something like MQTT could work. Yeah. And I think, uh, for example, Google has an old, probably by now abandoned um, 20% project called NSS Cache. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the problem is that it doesn't really work on FreeBSD because FreeBSD doesn't split off the password hashes in this dedicated shadow map. And instead, just hides the password hashes from non super users in the password map. Yeah. Which is uh, Linux. <laughs> but okay. By the way, are you familiar with net groups? Is that still being used? Is there any value in using it? I don't think so, right? Um, the problem is that mo- no, I think nothing but this really supports net groups. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think you can kind of, in theory, do it with LDAP if you hack a bit, but it's really how much trust do you want to put into mm-hmm. your hosts authenticating each other on mm-hmm. behalf of users? This is really the... Mm, all operators are trusted mindsets yeah. common in uh, universities, uh, which hopefully died a decade or two ago. Oh, no, no, no. I, I absolutely know universities who still use that. Oh, so do I. Um, <laughs> um, yes. Let's just... If we cut here, I can uh, say more about that. <laughs> Let's cut here. Let's cut here. So Vahejan, your problem is probably going to be using AutoFS, and uh, I'll I'll help you out with that. Is Vahe still here? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm his sure account I'm... is okay. Uh, I am you still. Are. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So um, uh, for your Clam AV, currently you're using FTP, which is not a bad solution. I mean, it's it's good for you know. Uh, we're doing it on the network layer, that's fine. But if your files get larger, FTP might not be enough, I think. Jan, um, you would know better. FTP is a terrible protocol for small files. It's an ugly but very fast protocol for large files. So Vahejan, are you expecting uh, like multiple large files or a lot of small files? Mm, file in smooth shorter in a loop. Okay, so it's it's yeah, it's going to be a lot of files. So maybe maybe but, we should think uh, about using something other than FTP. Yeah, but the, the WordPress was... solution uh, in the internet is GitHub or Karalia. I'm in a base script of a kill or you can do FS. Right, so yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So um, he, his solution was recursive mounting using a shell script, you know? Yeah, that, that works. That works. That, that's fine. Yeah, and that's, that's fine if you uh, can push it into the gen manager. Yeah. 
uh, into this to just have this be done as a create uh, as a as the GM starts running. Yeah, as a pre-start hook. Yeah, uh, why not? It's probably best to write it into a file. Yeah, the script and just invoke it instead of doing it in line. Yeah, yeah, or like you know, or 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 we can create the. Uh the uh, um the mount dot fs tab parameter you know with with the um, fs tab file wait it's um the mount command has an support to auto mount file systems the mount command has so it yeah. can use the fs tab and then auto mount everything in the fs tab and it can yeah. read the fs tab from standard input yeah so yeah, you can Pipe an FS tab to auto mount into the mount command. Yes. Yes. Which is how I do it sometimes. Yeah. Is get a WordPress solution, yes, Kalama install an element through Nasi Mitch Miakamit or J Lok the Lord said Lute. No, yeah, his his idea was what if he installs Clam A V on the on free NAS directly instead of uh, Don't do that uh, don't because do that. if you the problem is that TrueNAS assumes that it owns the host system so for example if you update true nas yeah. to a next version will, you don't know yeah. what will happen it might work it might not work it might break. and it may override your configuration files or delete them and... yeah 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 that's a good point it might delete your configuration files of clam av yeah that's a good point as well or yeah. clam av may get in the way of true nas working as expected mm -hmm. no no it's, it's because... better to keep it in the jail definitely yes of, of course it is yeah. Uh, exactly that's what you're supposed to do yeah okay anything else anyone or we're we just hit three hours yeah that's okay well um meeting adjourned uh see you see some of you tomorrow jan are you joining the beehive call probably probably okay sounds good and uh, otherwise we'll see everyone um uh, We'll see everyone uh, uh, next um, week. Um, okay, so it's um, past midnight UTC plus four, or what time is it in UTC? Eight o'clock? Uh, wait, let's just check uh, data. Uh, 20 o'clock plus a few minutes. Okay, so that's eight. Yeah, eight o'clock. Okay, sounds good. And uh, like, subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for hanging out with us for three hours. What's this wrong way. with you? What's, what? 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 Get a life. <laughs> no, oh, it's, it's, good. it's good. It's good. No, it's good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, that was perfect. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording and uh, see you all next week. <laughs>